Okay, we are live. So good morning. I would like to call the Calbright College Board of Trustees meeting to order this morning on November the 16th at uh, 9 a.m. And before the meeting gets started, um, I'd like the board liaison to review the meeting procedures and protocols. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you for joining us. I am Terry Lucas, the board liaison at Calbright College. You can follow our meeting agenda on board docs. The link can be found on our website, calbright.org under about board of trustees. For attendees who wish to make public comment, please use the Q&A feature to address the board for up to three minutes. Public comment should be used to address today's agenda. A reminder that this board meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the roll call. Um, can we proceed uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance? And I'm gonna ask um, uh, Bill Rawlings um, to lead us in that pledge, Bill. Sure, thank you for that. Please place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, is there any um, discussion of the order of the agenda? President Haynes, we still need to do the roll call. Oh, so I'm I'm sorry, please, please do the roll call. Okay. Hildegard Aguinaldo. Present. Darius Anderson. Amy Costa. Here. Joshua Lee L. Izondo. Tom Epstein. Here. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Jolina Grande. Here. Pamela Haynes. Here. Kevin Hall. Here. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Irma Ogwin. Jennifer Perry. Here. Bill Rawlings. Present. Roy Shabazian. Valerie Shaw. Here. Yulia Tarasova. Here. Los Villa Lobos. Here. And Joseph Williams. Here. Thank you. So we do have a quorum, is that correct? Yes, like that is correct. Thank you. Um, uh, is there any, do, do any of the trustees wish to change any of the order of the agenda? I see no hands raised. Um, so um, I'm gonna proceed um, with um, my president's report. Um, I had the opportunity and the, the pleasure of presenting uh, before the California Forwards Economic Summit um, last week. And it was my first time going to the summit, although I, it has a, a reputation and it was, a, it was an honor to be there. Um, so I had, my, I had my baptism by being there for the first time and by the comments that I was being asked to make. And it was, um, we, I was being asked to, uh, around what were the promising pathways within our community college system. And as I prepared that presentation and the things that I wanted to focus in on, um, there, were, there were several things that sort of became very clear to me um, uh, around um, what we were being asked to do. And, and uh, one of the things that actually made this very helpful was the work that we are doing um, as a board and what Calbright, why Calbright is in existence right now and why we are advocating so very hard um, and relentlessly for Calbright um, in California um, 
And in reality in the nation, um, I, I know folks don't, don't want us to focus in on the nation and we don't have to. California is big enough <laughs> that we can focus here on California. And some of those, um, some of those um, highlights are around that are the, the economic environment um, has changed nationally, but definitely here in California. There was a time when we could um, go into a career, go into a job, and we could expect on the outside of that 20 years later to get a, to get a gold watch and we would have had a very substantial career. That is no longer the case. That bell curve uh, for many, um, uh, not only Californians, but for many of our um, uh, Americans and across this world, um, we don't have that luxury. That those economic, um, the economic indicators is not a bell curve. It is, it is a, a narrow, multiple narrow mountain peaks because the economy is changing much more quickly. And as a result of those kinds of changes in the marketplace, we are, we are now being required to not only get into a career, um, if we're so lucky to do so, but to retrain and reskill often. And maybe we don't because many of us are old like me, um, but for, the, for, our, for our children and for our grandchildren in particular, I have grandchildren, and that's who I think of when I think of the marketplace for them. Um, I have to tell you that for my grandchildren, the two oldest ones that are out there, they've changed up three or four times right now in about three years. Um, part of that is um, the skills that they need, not just not, one of them graduated from UC Irvine, but, um, but it is that there is a need to be rethinking how we educate. And so I try to share that with those in the audience and those in the audience come out of their business people, their businessmen, their industry leaders, <clears throat> their community college um, leaders, they are economic development um, folks in their regions because this was regional and it was statewide. And um, I have to tell you that there were, there were um, supporters in the audience that understood what that looks like. And so if anything, what I would like to leave with us is that the work we are doing around Calbright is critically important to the work that needs to be done. Um, the other thing that I, I left with, and I have been a, a believer of this, and nobody was listening, but evidently somebody's listening now. Um, we have created in our ed inst educational institutions, especially of higher ed, two tracks. One track is the academic track. You're going to go off, you're going to go and you're going to go into college and then you're going to get a degree and then you're going to get a job. Now, the job isn't always identified, but every mother, father, parent knows that when, even when they send their kid to a university at the end of the day, me, at the end of the day, what I wanted was my kids to be educated. I wanted to be, them to be good, good citizens and residents and engaged in, in the work. I wanted them to be happy. But at the end of the day, I wanted them to have a job with some benefits. So, so there's that track, but there's also the second track and we've called it um, um, uh, career education, career technical education, but it, it's sort of the jobs track. And on that track, and there was a huge separation from those two. Um, what, what I have argued for in, in those places where people will, will we, need to we, we need to make sure those tracks are much closer together. Because at the end of the day, we're going out into the workforce, no matter what track we're on. And, we, and, and both of those tracks need cert a, a certain level of skills that are employable at the end of those journeys. And so there needs to be a multiple bridges over. And for me, I use that as an example because I spent, I, I went into community college immediately out of high school, spent two years there, didn't get a degree, got married. And um, both my husband and I said, oh, I need a job because your, your salary is not going to cut it. And that was, I don't even tell you how many decades ago that was. Um, the reality is I found 
and at a career education um, center, um, a American Airlines and Western Airlines were they had they had a little training program. You get the training, and then you get an interview, and then maybe you get a job. I got a job, and I stayed in that job for twenty years, and it had ultimately it had benefits, um, and it allowed me to go back to school. It took me forever, but it allowed me to follow my dreams because I had a decent job to do so. That is sort of what we're creating and hopefully the pathways for these jobs, and it appears that they are, these are jobs that are being created where the median salary is about $59,000 a year. That ain't chump change. So um, those are sort of the kinds of messages that I, I left um, hopefully, um, and um, and with that, um, some of my um, co-presenters -pre um, um, basically said, and we need to talk more about Calbright. And so, what I want to leave us with is sometimes we're gonna we're gonna be in we're gonna be in battles. We're gonna be um, working in advocacy around um, legislation around what is actually needed. We have folks including ourselves that can make the case for the reason why Calbright exists and the reason why it needs to continue to, to exist. Um, and I'm glad to be in that um, conversation, um, not only with the sort of outside folks, but I'm glad to be in that conversation with each of you. And that's the end of my, um, my report. And so I wanna um, uh, turn it over to our CEO and president for her report. Thank you so much, uh, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, and members of the Calbright Board of Trustees. Um, I wanted to begin by congratulating President Haynes and Vice President Costa for their re-election as President and Vice President of the Board of Governors. Um, we at Calbright are looking forward to your continued partnership and leadership. And also wanted to uh, offer an early welcome back to Chancellor Oakley, who will return to California after serving as Special Advisor to U.S. Secretary uh, Education Secretary Miguel Cordona, and to express my deep gratitude for Interim Chancellor Daisy Gonzalez and her steady leadership since the summer. Uh, at Calbright, we are continuing to move forward. We're currently in the process of formalizing, recognizing the California um, School Employees Association as the exclusive bargaining representative for our classified employees. This is a process, as many of you know, that's being directed by the Public Employment Relations Board, PERB, and we're very much looking forward to working with CSEA as our labor partner uh, at the conclusion of the recognition process. Throughout um, the end of the year and into early 22, uh, I have mentioned before, a core part of our focus is to expand our operations and build capacity for continued evaluation and iteration so that we can be making more data-informed decisions that are driving everything that we do, our research, our development, our improvement across the college, all in service of strengthening our student outcomes. And today I'm delighted to bring three new members for consideration on the Calbright team for your approval a student support specialist who will play a critical role as we continue to scale and pair the asynchronous online learning with high touch student engagement, a director of information systems who will help lead the very excellent work of our technology team to serve not only Calbright students, but also faculty and staff as our student center design and product continue to evolve throughout our startup period. And lastly, I'm very excited about a new vice president for workforce strategy and innovation Michael Younger. Michael Younger comes to us from the California Department of Labor, where he led critical strategic initiatives that advanced opportunity, particularly for underserved communities. At Calbright, he's going to be leading the engagement with workforce and economic development uh, partners throughout the state with a focus on regions like the Central Valley and the Inland Empire, uh, as we continue to support Californians who are both underrepresented in traditional institutions of higher education, um, but also in good jobs. Uh, and, and, and as we build the programs and the infrastructure that reflect the goals of our students, as well as the needs of employers and industry up and down the state. <clears throat> Building on this momentum, I am also pleased to share that uh, in our six month progress update to the California State Auditor's Office, we were able to report that Calbright has now implemented six of the 10 consolidated recommendations the auditor provided. 
in many cases uh, for recommendations that we have not yet fully implemented, the language states that we should establish a process or a policy uh, or a method for evaluating that policy's effectiveness by November 2021. So in a way, that's the stage of plans to make plans. And the final clause in several instances is that we demonstrate the effectiveness of those policies and measurement methods by July 2022. So we won't fully meet that criteria until uh, next uh, summer. This is significant progress as we continue to build the mission and critical infrastructure that'll allow for high quality growth throughout our seven year period, startup period. As a very student-centered institution, a fundamental part of our growth, and I've talked about this many times, relates to how we can actually best support our students and remain dedicated to constant evaluation and improvement. Um, because for us, we know that's not just essential that we support enrollment, but also persistence. And for that, it requires us to be implementing systems and outreach mechanisms that balance our learners' need for flexible pacing with encouragement and intervention so that they actually feel empowered to ask for help or to re-engage after time away from their coursework. And to that end, uh, later today, you'll be hearing about two exciting endeavors to help advance the ball for us on that front. Uh, in August, our student success team implemented <clears throat> a new protocol regarding proactive outreach to students. Uh, our data showed that students uh, are, who are engaged from the start remain engaged, and that's consistent with what the research tells us. They make more consistent progress in their program, and they feel uh, much more comfortable asking for help when it, when it involves connecting with a tutor or a discussion with an instructor or uh, engaging in career services opportunities. This also builds the sense of community that we have among our student population at Calbright. And it creates a very two-way relationship between our students and the college so that they can develop rapport with the folks on the support team uh, engaging their progress. The goal of this proactive outreach initiative is to help our learners, many of whom who have come to us after very mixed experiences with the higher education system. It helps them feel welcome and successful, not just early, but then throughout their journey, starting with that point of contact at the enrollment stage. We're already seeing some results on this front and equally important, we're gaining a lot of insight into our learners' goals and needs and how we best support them. Uh, I'm happy to report that in early October, you know, Calbright had about 518 students if we exclude those who were provisionally enrolled. And yesterday we crossed 600 students for what I believe is the first time in the school's history. And while this initial sign of traction is a good start, now it's very critical for us to really build uh, upon that foundation to really be precise about how we identify the processes for improvement and implement new strategies that can be driven by data in the way that we make decisions. Complementing our proactive outreach endeavors, I'm thrilled to seek approval for a new partnership between Calbright and UC Irvine's top ranked School of Education. This five-year collaboration will bring together two public institutions from two different systems of higher ed in the state, but with a shared goal of serving the community of learners. That's the focus population at Calbright. What I am actually most excited about in terms of the partnerships is that it's going to be a deeply cooperative and collaborative approach. The UCI and the Calbright teams will actively engage the existing skills and knowledge that Calbright staff and faculty already bring to bear but it'll increase our proficiency as a college to use specifically behavioral and data science strategies to provide more personalized supports within our model of education, but also for our unique student body. This is really gonna catalyze the momentum and advances already accomplished by the team at Calbright. And that's everything from enrollment management to proactive outreach. And it'll provide us internally with critical scalable information as we continue to innovate and identify those best practices um, to serve student needs and to foster their persistence. Every data improved improvement, every data informed improvement that we make at Calbright is a part of this larger equation for us. And that's the equation that is rooted in equity and this fundamental truth in California that opportunity needs to be real, tangible, and available to those who seek it. 
I really look forward to sharing more detailed updates on this topic in the coming months and years ahead, and uh, also to contribute to improvements and solutions that address a lot of the shared challenges that we're feeling uh, with our sister institution across the, co the community mm -hmm. college system. And we are really viewing ourselves as the leading edge of the learning curve uh, so that we can both share what we learn with our system campuses and collectively strive to help, especially the population of learners and the community of learners that we're focused on succeed in higher ed. Uh, I also wanted to close just by wishing the board a safe and relaxing holiday next week. Uh, for many of us, this is the first time we might be gathering together with friends and family since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so I hope you'll have a chance to, to rest and to spend time with family and friends in that kind of spirit of, of gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, President Mignon. Um, before we get, <clears throat> before we start with the consent agenda, I'd like to note that one of our presenters um, for um, item 3.4 um, will not be able to attend until approximately 10 a.m. Therefore, if we get <clears throat> to this item before that time, um, we're gonna hold off presenting on it until, um, after the information and the reports. So I just wanted to make note of that um, before we begin. Um, with that said, um, we are um, at our consent agenda. Um, is, there, um, is there anything that anyone wants to remove or speak to before um, uh, we um, I get a motion? President Haynes, I just wanted to um, speak to what your your remarks and President Manolan's, I never say it right, sorry, Ajita, it's just <laughs> um, um, remarks. Um, I just want to take this moment to um, just allow Ajita for the job she has done. She's often buffeted by strong winds um, from many corners of the state. And she has met every goalpost and guideline that is set out for her to meet and gone above and beyond that, this new partnership with Irvine is really exciting. And she's forming these partnerships as she's meeting all of these deadlines and dealing with you know, the many things that come at her. So um, I really think, speaking of Thanksgiving, um, we are ever grateful for your steadfast leadership. And I wanna pick up on something that President Haynes said, which is talking about um, us as sort of being Sorry, I'm, I'm extrapolating a little, little bit, President Haynes, but us being ambassadors for Calbright, we are, we are a large part of Calbright's constituency. And I think it's really contingent on us to potentially be more proactive in talking about Calbright in the public sphere and, sphere and talking about how it's differentiated from the other colleges, its efficacy, its possibilities, because I think some of that gets lost um, because we need to have a, a, a longer, a larger, stronger chorus of voices. So I'd love for us to be thinking, if it's appropriate, to be thinking about strategically doing some of that in the near future. Um, certainly you have given us a lot of good news um, to have crossed the 600 person um, enrollment milestone is amazing, the partnership that I mentioned. So I would like to, you know, if we can find strategic ways to, to trumpet the good and, and again, you know, talk about these, some of these issues that bedevil us, which is the differentiation and the lack of duplication and the, the way that Calbright truly is serving a unique part of the potential learner population and giving them opportunities that they have not had heretofore and would not have otherwise. So I just um, uh, th thank you so much, Jennifer, for those, those kind words and comments. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the driving force of all of this success that we're experiencing as an institution are the amazing and talented Calbright staff and faculty and students that we have in the college. And, you know, everything that I get to highlight and celebrate is really attributable to the work that they put in day in and day out. And, uh, you know, a lot of our focus as I talk about operational and capacity building <clears throat> is also on strengthening, you know, that team. And so I am both um, humbled and appreciative of the board support, um, continued support, and also uh, so grateful for the, the remarkable team we have at the college. And, and it's only growing. Thank you. We have a, a hand up for um, Trustee um, Williams. 
Yeah, I wanted to just um, echo those um, comments made by um, Member Perry. Um, I really have appreciated uh, watching the team develop and, you know, just the conversations and uh, listening to all of the great things that uh, Calvright is doing. And um, I agree we should promote more and wanted to just know if there's support for um, some additional advocacy, because I think in order to get access to the best thinking that um, Ajita and her team has, um, we need to help with removing some of the distractions. And, you know, I don't know if this board has ever asked for the uh, audit to be paused, um, but I, I feel like it feels like Calbright is in receivership because it's responding to the legislator and it's inappropriate. I've never seen a college um, have to uh, respond directly to the legislator. And, you know, as trustees, we should be the ones that are being held accountable, not the college specifically. And the college should be responding to us and not the legislator. And, you know, would there be support from the governor and from this board if we take that kind of stance with the, um, you know, the appropriate uh, entities to say that, you know, the, the board of trustees has been empowered by the governor and whatever the statute is, is to, to, to be the, the governing body of Calbright. And um, <clears throat> the audit is a, is a distraction from what, um, you know, the, the team really should be focused on. And so, you know, again, I, I just want to have that conversation. Is there support to advocate in that kind of way with the governor's office and with the legislator to say, let Cal Bright be responsible to the board of trustees and not to this, you know, pr other process that's out there? Well, let me sort of respond very quickly. We're, we're at the, um, the, the audit is over uh, other than our reporting portions of it. And, um, and the, the challenge is that um, we don't get an appropriation, we get a, a, a stated amount. And, and even, I, even in some of those, and I'm gonna, and, and this requires a, probably another longer conversation at some point, but even as um, the audit was going on and I delineated that this is a board of trustees, um, there's, 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 there's resistance. And part of that is because we are constituted under, under Brown Act as a board of trustees, and indeed we are, but we also, and this is a very interesting, it's this, this um, Calbright that we have, it's statewide. It's not singularly located in a region or, um, uh, or, or, or that sort of situation. Um, and then we also, const we're also constituted as the board of governors. And so, there is indeed work to do, and there is indeed work to do relative to our advocacy as a, as a body to the legislators. Um, because I think that uh, if they hear from us and hear all of the good things that um, Calbright is doing, um, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, and, and I think that's where our power is, um, we all know, we all um, participate in, the, in, in an advocacy position relative to the work that we're doing. I think we need to make our voices known, um, but we have a great team. Uh, I see Jenny on, um, on, on this, uh, in this meeting as well. We've got, um, we've got great for, um, advocates in the building, but <clears throat> to your point, we need to be heard as, as members of the board in, the, in a leadership role. And I think there is indeed a role to play. And I'm hoping that somebody's taking notes and we figure out what that strategy looks like as we move forward into the legislative cycle. Thank you. Thank you. And we're at the ready to support whatever the board needs uh, in, the, in that regard. So um, we will take it under advisement and also also follow up with uh, with you, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, with that said, <clears throat> I uh, need a a motion um, and a second for the consent agenda. This is Member Grande. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. Grande moves. Can I get a second, please? I'll second. Rawlings. Rawlings seconds. Um, would you please call the roll? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Darius Anderson. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Jelena Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. Aye. 
Kevin Hall. Aye. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Irma Ogwin. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye. Phil Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. <laughs> Valerie Shaw. Yes. Yulia Tarasova. Aye. Los Villalobos. Aye. And Joseph Williams. Yes. Motion carries, President Haynes. Thank you. So we're moving into item 3.1, which is um, uh, the um, discussion around the VP for uh, workforce and strategies and uh, strategy innovation. And um, Chief Financial and Administrative Officer Jeff Bell will pre be presenting on this item. Mr. Bell. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we are recommending promote. Uh, this is one of the positions that we are coming to you with this month. Uh, this is going to be our, our new and we are recommending approval on this position. Uh, this is one of the positions that the president was talking about earlier. Uh, we think this is uh, part of our greater strategy to improve. Uh, services here to our students, and we are recommending approval. Are there any comments by, by our um, members? I see um, President, uh, Vice President um, Costas' hand up. Yeah, I think this is a question for President Minnan, which is just there's a lot of energy in workforce development right now. We talked about that yesterday. So briefly, can you just kind of say what you see kind of coming our way in the next couple of months, given kind of this infusion of dollars and emphasis on workforce development? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think, um, and this, this actually underscores the kind of leadership choice on this front as well. Um, you know, the state is investing a considerable amount in also rethinking the engagement and services of a lot of our agents on the economic development and workforce development side. And so we want to position ourselves to be partners with them in this work. And indeed, uh, President Haynes and others have identified um, the ways in which workforce boards and, and workforce development entities are beginning to view the shifting ground underneath them, largely responsive to how they're watching and, and, and seeing people experience the labor market differently than in past periods. And so, uh, you know, we have similarly deepened our conversations in key focus regions of the state that have been articulated in our strategic vision um, to dive into the, the shared challenges that are being faced in those regions and communities and to see what role we have to play in it. And it's often not a traditional role. It doesn't displace the important role that local districts and community colleges or regional districts play uh, in that work and activity, but it is usually uh, with an eye towards some of the intractable challenges that they are facing in the broader uh, sense of planning. So um, it is, uh, this type of a position is very much positioned to deepen that, uh, that engagement work with key workforce development areas um, in the regions that we're focused on. And more broadly than that, actually, and Michael in particular brings to the table uh, an interesting background with both, with both um, the employer side and the industry side of things as well, having worked within the context of those organizations around hiring initiatives and other things. So really to understand the mindset of employers and industries, those people that are making the hiring decisions um, that are going to be determinative for our folks in facilitating smooth labor market transitions. So a strong person, both in terms of strategy, a person who can also carry forward a lot of the execution and programmatic responsibilities that we have, but someone who also, you know, holds the seat at the table for um, the ways in which employers might be making these decisions. I will, I will also just add, and, and this is just a, a bonus for us too, in addition to that deep subject matter and programmatic, subject matter and programmatic expertise, um, he also brings to the table an asset to our leadership team. Um, that's a complement to, to some of the skills and, and that we have of the team itself uh, around management. He's Six Sigma certified. He's um, able to really uh, think about how we might support how our leadership team carries out a lot of our duties and responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, board member <clears throat> Epstein. Yes, thanks. Um, the, uh, the one thing I was going to ask is, 
I think repeatedly when you've brought new positions here for us to approve, uh, there have been requests to include a resume and a job description on these uh, leadership positions. Uh, uh, we do normally send that out. Did that not come in background materials? Uh, no. Nope. Uh, we can go ahead and maybe Terry and you can circulate that. Um, I do have, in, I usually keep in, information on the recruitment cycle of things. So I'm happy to also provide that, which I do have at the ready. No, I, I think just when, when we're voting individually on in person, I think we should know exactly what the job is and, uh, and have their resume. Are there um, other questions from our um, board members? I don't see any hands raised. Um, is there a public comment on this item? There is no public comment, President Haynes. Well, given that, then can um, I get a motion on this item and a second? So move. Williams moves um, a second. I'll second. A solo second. Uh, okay. Yulia maybe beat me. Okay, then. <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, that second is from uh, member uh, Teresova. Um, can I ask a point of order? Because I actually do board member Epstein kind of had a, a good point. And I'm wondering if we can take this maybe out of order once the, the staff is able to provide the information requested. Yeah, that's fine. You can do that. Okay, so we want to hold off on the. Is that is that your request until you get the information? Yeah, Mr. President, if that's okay. I think it's a, a fair point that we should have a job description and a resume before we formally vote. Okay, then we'll we'll put off the vote on this one. Um, can I get an idea from from staff, or at least let us know when when our our, our trustees has that information? Yes, I will um, make a note as soon as I send that. Okay. Thank you. So then <clears throat> let us um, go to the next um, item on the agenda, which is 3.2. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, that, that is uh, the Board of Trustees and Executive Committee meeting dates for 2022. And we have our Chief of Staff, Carmen Drummond, presenting on this item. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, and trustees of the board. The tentative Board of Trustees and Executive Committee meeting schedule for 2022 was presented as an information item for discussion at the most recent Board of Trustees Executive Committee meeting on October 20th. The trustees were in agreement with this schedule, so therefore we are presenting for your approval <laughs> Um, the Board of Trustees and Executive Committee meeting dates for 2022. So it, um, this is an opportunity. Uh, hopefully everyone has seen um, the, um, the dates and you've looked at your calendars to make certain that there's no, at this point, that there's no conflicts in that. Um, if there is, this is, um, it, it was, I think this was sent out to you ahead of time. Um, with that, is there any other public, is there any other, sorry, uh, board member comments? I'll move to approve. All right, then we have Epstein moving to approve. Can I get a second on this item? Second, Shabazian. Shabazian, um, thank you for joining us. We'll second on that item. Um, is there any public comment? Or did I ask that already? No, you did not. There is no public comment. Thank you. I didn't ask that. Okay. Um, better late than never. Um, but we do now have a, um, a, uh, a motion and a second. So can I get a roll call on it? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Darius Anderson. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Jolena Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. Aye. Kevin Hull. Aye. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. <laughs> Irma Ogwin. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye. 
Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Yes. Yulia Tarasova. Aye. Los Villa Lobos. Aye. And Joseph Williams. Aye. Motion carries, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, then we're going to move to item um, 3.3, which is the um, AB 361 resolution to reconsider the circumstances of the state uh, of emergency and to authorize remote teleconference meetings. We have to approve this um, almost every month um, until we um, decide when we're going to be going back to into um, uh, into um, in-person meetings. We have um, Cynthia Smith from um, F3 presenting on the item. Good morning and thank you, President Haynes, Vice President Costa and members of the Board of Trustees. Resolution 2021-10 is a continuation of Calbright's obligations pursuant to AB 361 regarding holding its board meetings by remote means during the continuing state of emergency due to COVID-19. At the special meeting on October 12th, um, the executive committee adopted resolution 2021-07, which made findings that as a result of the continuing state of emergency due to COVID-19, mm -hmm. meeting in person would present imminent risks to the health and safety of meeting attendees. And as uh, President Haynes mentioned, AB 361 re requires local agencies to reconsider every 30 days the circumstances of the state of emergency and whether it continues to directly impact the ability of attendees to meet in person. So before you today for consideration is resolution 2021-10, which makes the required findings regarding reconsideration of the state of emergency on behalf of Calbright. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Do the, any of the trustees have questions? I see no hands um, raised on that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, is there um, public comment on, on this item? President Haynes, there is no public comment. Given that, then can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll move. Perry moves. Can I get a second? Second. Please? William seconds. Um, then, second. Thank you. And then would you call the roll? Eldegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Jelena Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. Aye. Kevin Hull. Aye. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Irma Ogwin. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Yes. Yulia Tarasova. Aye. Los Villa Lobos. Aye. And Joseph Williams. Aye. Motion carries, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, we are going to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> we are going to move <clears throat> into our um, information and reports. The first one, um, uh, 4.1, would be the first quarter 2021 22 budget update. And we have um, Jeff Bell presenting on this item. Yes, good morning, Madam President, again, and Madam Vice President and Trustees. Of course, board policy 6300 requires the CEO to make quarterly reports to the board and keep the board fully advised regarding financial status of the college, including a mid-year report showing the financial and budgetary condition of the college. Uh, that will be provided later this fiscal year. But to give you a sense now, pursuant to these reporting requirements, the slide deck that's going to be presented before you um, represents the, um, excuse me, slide deck before you represents uh, the first quarter budget update for fiscal year 21-22 and gives you kind of an early snapshot of where the Calbright is in terms of expenditures and revenues at the end of September of this year. Next slide, please. Now, of course, this budget represents the first of the three years, just to give us a, a, a reference point, first to three years of implementation of the college's strategic vision with particular emphasis 
on serving the unique needs of our working adults. And it also reflects the requirements of unique needs to Calbright College. These include the costs associated with implementing the key statutory obligations as significant new costs associated with the recommendations as the president was referring to earlier from the state auditor. Next slide, please. To give us a sense of a baseline budget and ground us in our discussion, this is our base budget that we talked about and that was approved by the board earlier, reminding us of where we started from as we head into our fiscal year. I would point out there is a typo um, anywhere in the second column that you see the 38815, that should be 33815. And I'm sorry for that typo. It is also, uh, it is, carries over into two, two lines and that line right there, 38815 should be 33315. 30, I'm sorry, 33815. I apologize for that typo. This is our baseline budget that, that was uh, approved by the board uh, when we adopted our budget for this year with our annual funding at 15 million uh, for total expenses, one-time funding of 44, basically 44.4 with a total budget of 59.4 for our total expenditures. Next slide, please. The next couple slides cover our annual funding and as is expected and is budgeted, a considerable portion of our annual funding is expended on salaries and benefits. Now at the time of these slides were presented, they had, we had 54, 54 FTEs, but we've gone up to 55 since then and with more on the way. Operational expenditures for the first quarter were a modest 406,000 However, with that figure can be attributed to 316,000 that were transferred to the prior year. Otherwise, our operating expenditures for the first quarter would have been 722,000. Now about two thirds of those funds, as you can see, were expenditures that were in areas of audits and legal mandates and consulting. You can see that here. Oh, next, thank you. Uh, somebody went to the next slide. Thank you very much. I can walk you through the figures here. Um, as you can see uh, in, the, in the center column, you can see the 406,000 that I was referring to in operating and expenses. Um, that's the 406,000. Uh, academic salaries and non-academic salaries, you can see are tracking for, the, for what was adopted in our budget. Benefits and non-academic, uh, academic and non-academic are tracking as well with non-academic benefits being a little lower than expected. So we will um, be looking at them very closely as we look towards our, our mid-year um, report for the board. Next slide, please. Just a second. The next several slides just shows examples of what our one-time funding expenditures have been. And as you can see, we are still below uh, typical expenditures for the first quarter. Uh, at the end of September, you can see 126,000 have been expended on students experience through strategic planning and development as we, uh, contemplate contracts for the next remainder of the second quarter, we expect increased costs in this area to increase significantly. Next slide, please. Uh, to date, 365,000 is again has been recorded for external affairs, outreach and marketing, just to give you a flavor of one-time one funding. Uh, next slide, please. And as we go into our one-time funding associated with our facilities and infrastructure, we've spent almost $53,000 on our enterprise resource and planning systems. And about 294,000 has been sent, spent on cap outlay. Um, this has been primarily spent in the areas of computer technology and um, hotspots, as well as um, the, uh, excuse me, 
hotspots and additional computer uh, Chromebooks for our students. Next slide, please. So with that, you can see that our one-time funds are tracking uh, academic salaries are, are at 42,000, non-academic at 382,000, and total expenses for one-time funds are at 1.6 million thus far this quarter. Next slide, please. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. And in summary, say that there's been a lot of planning so far with our funds in the first quarter. We anticipate considerable additional expenditures as we head into our mid-year report that we'll be providing you uh, following our December report. And it looks like we have a couple questions I'll be happy to entertain at your convenience. Thank you. Um, so we have a few questions from our um, board members. Uh, I'll go I'll go with um, Trustee um, Epstein first and then Member Hall and then Member Shabazian. Uh, thanks. Um, the question I have on the, um, I think it's slide three, fiscal year 2021-22 final budget. And it, if you look at the, um, the academic benefits and the non-academic benefits, um, there are what looked to me like kind of unusual anomalies. And I'm, I'm just curious why, if you look at the, uh, at the academic um, salaries and benefits uh, in the total line, um, the benefits are more than half of the salaries. Whereas for the non-academic, the benefits are about a third of the salaries. And also in the one-time funds, uh, the academic benefits are two and a half times what the academic salaries are. So I, I don't understand why there's such a disparity between benefits and salary for academic and non-academic employees. And I don't understand why there would be such an imbalance in the one-time funds. This is on slide three. Fiscal year 2021-22 budget, final budget. Right, and so that's what that's what we had budgeted. Uh, these are the resources that we budgeted for those specific areas. Uh, that's that I'll be happy to get back to you on uh, why we had budgeted that level for those specific areas um, for our total resources in those specific areas. Uh, Member Epstein, I'll be happy to talk with you further about that online if you'd like, offline if you'd well, like, rather. Well, no, I think this is something the whole board needs to hear. Uh, President sure. Mayor, do you, do you have an answer? Well, but before, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, I am happy to follow up with the full board uh, in terms of these specific line items on the budget assumptions governing the final approved budget. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to do that and follow up. And, and I'll be happy to provide whatever detail we need to provide to ensure that the question is answered. Can, can we do that while this meeting's going on? Uh, I'll need to go back and look into the, re, the, the assumptions that we did when we did the final budget, Member Epstein. I'm okay. sorry, I don't have that in front of me. I mean, do you acknowledge that that looks weird? I mean, I'm not a finance expert by any stretch, but it just seems very odd to me. No, I, I think there will be a reason behind it. And I think that it'll, it'll provide appropriate rationale for why the board adopted budget was appropriate. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Member Hall. Thank you. Um, I think it was on your first slide it shows a contingency reserve of 9.4%. Is that, is, is 9.4 a, a standard um, reserve amount? I mean, is that, is that better than what uh, a comparable organization would have or do we need to put more aside? It, it is a reasonably and prudent amount. I'd say it's probably um, on the higher side. Okay. Um, and then just, just a comment, you know, as we all know, the legislature looks closely at Calbright's expenses. So I just 
I think I've said this to you before too, and, and maybe you're doing it. I just want to make sure that we are really keeping an eye on expenses, that we control them, that we keep them reasonable, and that we, we can always respond to the legislature's questions about whether we're expending too much or whether we're really staying within a reasonable budget. Um, so I just want to make sure we do that. And that then segues back to member Epstein's question about um, the benefits. You know, we, we should be able to respond to these immediately because that, that seems like a big budget item to me as well. So that, that's my comment. Thank you. It's, uh, it's going. It's... Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. It's it is strange, President Haynes. I saw a message come up, but it does say it's recording. Okay, thank you, because um, it does need to be recorded. Um, and let me just respond um, just a little bit more to um, Member Hall's question about a reserve. Um, being on a, a trustee board for more than 22 years, um, it, for, for, for um, boards across the state, that reserve is critically important, um, especially in, uh, during the times of recession. And so um, I can just, I, I won't speak for every single trustee board across the state, but I will speak for Los Rios, who's had a reputation for being very fiscally conservative. Um, we have continued to encourage our, um, uh, our district to maintain a very robust um, uh, reserve. Um, that's money um, that's either an actual reserve. And, and right now, I think our reserve is um, a, a little bit above 10%. Um, and, but, but that is bolstered by other dollars within the budget that can be used um, at, at the district's um, um, discretion relative to if anything were to happen in terms of re a recession. Uh, that comes into play. We've just come out of what we thought was going to be a terrible recession. Um, but in the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, 2010, we were able, and it, it was lessons learned, we, we were able to smooth out how many people we had to let go and how many people we could keep relative to that reserve. And how, so for, for us, we continue to make certain that there's, there is that knowledge of having enough reserves on hand to be able to do the business, business of a community college. So um, I would say that that, uh, I would say that that nine point whatever is, is, um, is, is, is um, I don't say it's high. I just say it, 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 it is um, robust enough that if anything were to happen, um, we could still keep operations going for a limited period of time. Thank you. Um, and so, um, Member Shabazian, your hand is up and you, you can speak, ask your question or make your comment. Thank you. So I'm having some connection problems. I'm gonna keep my video off to try to help with the audio. Uh, question about instruction, like the percentage of our budget that goes to instruction. Do you have an idea of what that is? I do not have that handy. I will have to give you a percentage of instructional um, instructional dollar or instructional percentage rather. That's something I can get back to you with Mr. Shabazian. Thank you. And the question is related to the 50% rule. So using that definition of instructional. I see. With that, um, are there any other questions from um, the board? This is a, it, uh, I'm gonna ask for public comment um, for this then. Is there public comment? Yes, President Haynes, there is public comment from Eric Kaljumagi. Now I wanna make certain, um, I believe that his comment is on another item, which is 3.3. So. Um, I don't, it may not be on this one, but he does but, have one on this one. Okay, perfect. Well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Um, Kajamaji. Are you on mute?
Terry, is there a problem with his 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 feed? I I asked him to unmute. Is he having problems? Can you hear me? Oh, oh, there you are. I see your, I see a picture of you. Okay. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, good morning, good uh, morning, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, College President Menon, and members of the board. Uh, it might be worth noting, just as a preamble, that informing uh, the members of the public how they can properly give public comment might be wise. I attempted to raise my hand earlier, but it wasn't uh, noticed. In any event, on this particular item, the budget needs to be published. Calbright's budget needs to be published. Not a 10-page uh, PowerPoint presentation, the actual budget document that includes the line items. Otherwise, the public has only a general sense of Calbright's fiscal goals. More worrisome, this anomaly from common practice violates the board's intent to be transparent in its actions. I ask the board members to go to any of the other community colleges. You can go to Mount Sac, you can go to Los Rios, it really doesn't matter. But look up their budget, see what a published budget normally looks like and insist that Calbright follow similar standards. And since I happen to forget it, having getting a little flustered with the uh, muting issue, I am Eric Calumagi. I'm the president of the Community College Association, which is the CTA affiliate dealing with community college matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Are there any other um, public comments on, on this item? No, there is not, President Haynes. All right, thank you. Um, it's a little, it's just a couple of minutes after 10. Um, is the one of the presenters um, here at this point? Do we know? Yes, I see both, I see um, Dean Aram and I see Professor Castleman both on the line, I believe so. All right, then the, then we're going to go back to that particular. Um, or, or sorry, this is an information. This is no, this is not. This is a um, three point four. Sorry, um, the Calbright um, College, University of California, Irvine partnership um, proposal, and we have Ted Lai, VP of Student Services and Success presenting and I will allow uh, Mr. Lai to um, introduce um, uh, his presenters. Thank you, President Haynes, Vice President Costa and members of the board. Um, my name is Ted Lai and I'm here to talk a little bit about the um, partnership with UC University of California, Irvine. And let me share my screen. I thank you for this time. Um, we're here to talk to you about uh, an exciting proposal for a partnership with the University of California, Irvine. And uh, just to give you an idea of the motivation behind this, really, this all comes back to Calbright's mission, which is to deliver high quality, affordable, and flexible higher education opportunities for working learners who lack access to traditional forms of higher education. As you know, uh, we have a highly skilled team uh, at the same time, we are trying to create some new and responsive approaches uh, to really how we support the working learners as well as attract other ones. So with this partnership with UCI, we have this opportunity now uh, to work with a team that really has some innovative approaches for, for advancing effective instructional practices and advising practices as well that are based upon behavioral science and data. And this will further amplify the work that we're currently doing, but also that we want to do to make sure that we are as intentional as, as possible as we continue to design supports for our students. Um, with that, I want to hand it over to Dean Aram 
uh, with UCI uh, to talk more about the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And um, thank you for the board for making time for this item. Uh, UCI School of Education, uh, like Calbright, is actually a new unit. We've only, uh, we're only in our ninth year as a school. Uh, and yet already at UCI, we're the highest ranking academic unit at UCI, the seventh, um, uh, this, according to US News, the seventh best public school of education in the country. And we've built our expertise and capacity around this, just this kind of work, data-driven institutional improvement work around undergraduate education and also in partnership with the community and, and public institutions in the community. And so let me speak just for a moment or two on both of that, but both of those items. Uh, our, uh, our unit was the first unit in the country to uh, hire explicitly someone in the area of research practice partnerships. This is an idea that uh, uh, you bring the academic capacity of universities to bear on supporting community partners, not by simply bringing uh, seeing them as a site for research, but seeing them as partners in the research where they are actively engaged in shaping and identifying the research uh, efforts that are designed to improve uh, their, their institutional performance. So we co-create with our partners uh, focused research activities. We're doing that with uh, uh, most of the large uh, public school districts in Orange County, as well as other institutional partners. We also, starting in fall 2019, created a state-of-the-art undergraduate measurement project at UCI, where we are collecting information that integrates administrative data on uh, how students are interacting with administrative services, their course grades and trajectories with data derived from the learning management systems, that is their, uh, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 electronic version of where, uh, where they're interacting uh, with instructors and course materials, as well as uh, um, uh, very focused work uh, with uh, surveys of students and performance assessments and other data collecting information on their lived experiences. We're using that, that data to improve institutional performance at UCI, and we're very eager to kind of extend that work uh, under the direction of uh, Ben Kalselman to work with Calbright in using similar techniques and approaches to help uh, Calbright at, uh, achieve its objectives with data-driven uh, 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 approaches. Thank you, Dean Aram. And now I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Ben Castleman to talk about the partnership and some of the details. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Dean Aram. And thank you, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, and members of the board for the, your time today. Um, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide, Ted. So the, the partnership that, that Ted and, and Dean Aram uh, described will involve three primary strategies, which we are eager to apply across the life cycle of students' engagement with Calbright, from when they are first considering the institution um, to the point where they are, they've completed their program, they are pursuing well-aligned career opportunities. The first strategy is to apply insight from behavioral economics and nudge approaches to support students to navigate key academic processes at Calbright, uh, again, across their academic life cycle with the goal of achieving academic success and to position students to pursue well-matched career opportunities. The second primary strategy will be to use advanced data analytics approaches to provide Calbright students with highly tailored educational and career pathways that position them for success while they are at Calbright and after they enter the labor market or return to the labor market. And the third primary strategy will be to leverage interactive and state-of-the-art technologies to strengthen the Calbright program model 
and to promote as regular and personalized interactions between Calbright students, faculty, and staff as possible. Next slide, please. Consistent with what Dean Aram shared and, and the principles guiding the UCI Irvine <laughs> School of Education, this proposed five-year Calbright UCI partnership will be guided by several core principles. The first among those is over the course of this partnership to continuously design and rigorously test innovative approaches that both support Calbright's overall mission and advance its strategic vision to do so in a way that is highly collaborative with and capacity building of Calbright staff and faculty members uh, so that in, during the partnership and certainly afterwards, uh, Calbright has independent capacity to sustain and scale evidence-based strategies that emerge from our collective work. And then finally, to be guided by the principle of active and ongoing documentation and dissemination of lessons learned to help build a knowledge base in California and more broadly about what works best for working learners. In the next two slides, I'll provide uh, additional detail on the partnership activities. Uh, to begin, as, as I mentioned before, we propose to use a combination of data analysis and behavioral diagnostic approaches to identify bottlenecks that currently hinder Calbright students from reaching their goals and to use those same behavioral and data science strategies uh, to design action-oriented approaches that address those bottle bottlenecks, again, across students' life cycle and position them for academic and career success. To provide you a couple of examples on the data analytic front, uh, we would investigate academic performance, and the LMS data that Calbright currently maintains and, and, and will maintain increasingly going forward to identify successful curricular pathways for different profiles of students and put that analysis into action by developing recommendation engines that provide students with personalized curricular pathway guidance based on their indi individual performance and educational and work experience coming into the program. On the behavioral diagnostic front, uh, one example is that we would audit the student life cycle uh, to identify throughout Calbright to identify ways that we might increase students engagement in specific academic and non academic behaviors that are correlated with academic success. And then put that diagnosis into action by providing faculty and staff with real time and tailored information that they can use to nudge students towards behaviors correlated with stronger performance. These examples are on the side of strengthening students' academic performance from when they first begin at Calbright all the way through their program. We have an equal interest, uh, and if you don't mind advancing to the next slide, uh, Ted, uh, to apply these data and behavioral uh, diagnostic and action strategies to strengthen students' career outcomes. So on the data analytic front, uh, we propose to conduct as rigorous longitudinal evaluations as we can of students' employment outcomes and how this varies across different student profiles and programs of study, and then put that analysis into, into action by developing recommender systems that provide students with personalized guidance on job and career pathways that position them for labor market success. On the behavioral diagnostic front, uh, we propose to identify opportunities for fostering career exploration and preparation with Calbright coaches, peers, and alumni uh, early on and then throughout students' time at Calbright, and then to integrate behavioral nudges and technology-enabled solutions that help students access real-time career advising and supports as they prepare to transition back into uh, jobs in the labor market. These proposed applications of behavioral science and data science have an increasingly strong and evidence-based foundation um, across post-secondary education. I'll offer just a couple of examples, concrete examples, to provide grounding for our proposal. Um, one example, there's a lot of work currently on, uh, on the large impacts that, that we can obtain in terms of improving student success by providing a combination of high-touch coaching to support students and using predictive analytics um, that support coaches to target their outreach to students who might most benefit and to help those coaches identify specific areas of support that might, might 
uh, most benefit students um, to, to maintain strong academic trajectories. In addition to leveraging professional coaches, uh, there's growing work and interest in uh, leveraging the, the social power and influence, positive influence of peer mentors. We currently have the opportunity uh, to work with the Tennessee Board of Regents on an adult peer mentor uh, project in which adults who have come back already and are finding academic success are providing ongoing mentoring to new adult learners to provide a positive peer connection and to help them connect to campus resources and supports. In addition to these more intensive forms of, of outreach and engagement, there's also a fairly large evidence base on the, the effect that behaviorally informed and lower touch strategies can have. Um, goal setting is one example. Um, evidence suggests that prompting college students to reflect on goals, uh, reflect on the implication of achieving those goals and, and to develop detailed implement implementation plans for how to realize those goals leads to better academic performance and reductions importantly in student stress and anxiety. Similarly, there's a rapidly expanding uh, set of applications of data science strategies in post-secondary education, some of which we're very fortunate to be, uh, to be piloting uh, now and, and in the months and years to come. Uh, for instance, working with a community college, uh, we've developed an algorithm that generates personalized course recommendations that uh, support students to meet program requirements and that maximize their predicted probability of academic success. In parallel, we've had the opportunity to develop an algorithm that provides community college graduates with personalized job matches in their communities that align with their program of study and offer strong compensation and employment stability. In addition to these uh, program-wide uh, applications of data science, there's also, including coming out of uh, the great faculty, staff, and students at, at UC Irvine, really interesting work leveraging uh, very detailed data from learning management systems uh, to provide students with very tailored real-time guidance um, and feedback on their academic progress. So one example is using learning management system data on whether students have completed assignments for a course um, to provide students notifications when they're missing assignments. Doing so, evidence suggests, leads to higher rates of assignment completion and course performance. Hopefully that provides you a brief but informative overview of our proposed partnership with Calbright to apply behavioral and data science strategies to support Calbright student success throughout their engagement with the institution and then back into the labor market. Um, my colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Thank you again very much for your time. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, are there any questions from, um, I see hands raised um, from, our, from our board members. Um, I have, um, Trustee Grande, um, Hall, and then Aguinaldo, and then Shabazian. So we, um, we'll start with uh, uh, Board Member Grande. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the information that was presented to us, especially the level of collaboration that it appears as though we're about to embark on with such a prestigious institution in my neck of the woods, which is UCI. I was just wondering though, because as I'm reading through the documents here, it seems as though this is more along the lines of almost a, a consulting contract rather than an ultimate partnership. I didn't see any um, indication of the level of financial support that UCI was going to be contributing to match the level of financial commitment that Calbright is asking for. And then I was wondering if this is more along the lines of a consulting contract, was this the outcome of a competitive bidding process by which we had entertained other uh, potential collaborations or partnerships? Thanks, Shalina. Um, so this is, uh, this is not something that we bid out. It was a collaboration that we developed out of the need that Calbright uh, was facing and experiencing with respect to um, this body of work. So it is, um, you know, I think it is a, a unique partnership in that a large part of what this is focused on in the in the early part of the partnership is very much leaning on the staffing capacity and expertise of the team at UCI so that we can build 
our capacity uh, over time to, to be able to raise the level of proficiency within the organization over time. So, um, you know, it is uh, a lot of resources on the part of uh, UCI's uh, existing team of expertise and um, uh, staffing and su support that um, Dr. Arum and Dr. Castleman uh, bring to the table in accomplishing the work. Uh, member Hall. Thank you. Um, so the program looks amazing. Um, I'm just not sure how, how, and maybe this is too long of a discussion to have right now, but I'm not sure how it works per student. So when a student enters Calbright, is, is every student afforded these, these services uh, that, that enters Calbright? And, and if so, I mean, how many people coaches, tutors, um, whatever, are, are, are handling each student. I, I, I guess I'm trying to get a grip on how it's done in a practical way and then you know, what, what, what the resources are to have to be devoted to that and then what, what are the ultimate costs? Yes, so I mean, these are assistive resources in designing the, the programs, the interventions and the activities, including some of the specific natures of the communications that, um, that will be involved in testing out the efficacy of those interactions. And so it is not that we are outsourcing our counseling functions or outsourcing our student support functions or anything in that regard. So there's not direct services to students through this. It is to help us structure the way that we do all of our pro programmatic design and intervention. So it's a capacity building exercise largely for that, that purpose because it is, um, it is not contracting out of direct services. That's that stuff our staff does. I see, yeah, like I say, I mean, it, it looks amazing, um, but boy, it seems so, I mean, it, it, it's just gonna require so many resources, but, but you know, that, that, that's what we're supposed to do, so. Um, and, and Dr. Kesselman, it might be worth like you've done this work with other systems, other state agencies, other higher ed institutions. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, how your team works essentially with a, with a receiving institution in terms of um, uh, building out some of these capacities? Of course. Thank you, President Menden. And, and, and uh, Member Hall, I very much appreciate your question. I... Um, one of, I think, the most unique features and exciting features from my perspective about this partnership is Calbright's uh, uh, vision um, and interest in integrating behavioral and data science strategies throughout the life cycle of students' engagement. So as, as you hopefully got a, a little bit of an illustration from the examples I provided, there have been numerous discrete applications. What I mean by that is using nudges to increase uh, financial aid refiling using data science to uh, strengthen community college transfer. This is the first research uh, practice partnership of which I'm aware that has the ambition of integrating those approaches across the life cycle. And so your resource uh, question is, is very well taken. From my perspective, the combination of um, applied behavioral insights and data science and technology um, have several objectives in a way of strengthening um, the efficacy of Calbright's existing faculty and staff. One, the behavioral insights hopefully are very effective at engaging students um, and helping them stay connected to their faculty um, and, and staff supports uh, in a way that they might not otherwise would be. And so hopefully using nudges and other approaches, we can foster strong connections, maintain strong connections throughout. The data science is hopefully useful in targeting students who might need additional support and to provide students with tailored guidance uh, for academic success and then career success in a way that hopefully strengthens um, students' uh, personalized approach to, to charting a path for success at the institution. And then by leveraging technology, we're hopefully increasing the efficiency of both student and staff time. Um, so that would be the vision for how we would uh, ideally reach as many Calbright students as possible, but do so in a way that is feasible within Calbright's existing fa uh, faculty and staff resources. Thank you. Member Shabazian. 
Yeah, um, I appreciated uh, the question that uh, board member Grande asked. Uh, and I also wanted to just commend the focus, especially for competency-based education to focus on coaching and mentoring, because I think those are two key aspects of this kind of delivery. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, member um, um, Aguinaldo, and then we have a member, uh, Vice President Costa, and um, board member Williams. Thank you very much, President Haynes. Um, first, I just wanted to take thank the presenters, um, Dr. Castleman, Dr. Roman, and also Ajita, because I think partnerships like this really elevate Calbright's stature as a spot partner and not just a service delivery provider. So I just want to commend all the work that has gone into not only finding this partnership, but getting it to the point where it's now before the board. So thank you very much for all your work on that. Um, I'm going to ask Ajita kind of an unfair question because it builds upon a conversation we had at yesterday's board meeting for the Board of Governors, where folks from um, all sorts of great student or student focused organizations like Umoja, um, the HBCU, and as well as HUMN came forth to talk about their role and their importance in, in helping students. And what I appreciate about their programs is that it is very high touch and it's cohort based, but in a different type of cohorty way than how we talk about at Calbright. So I'd like to just get some very high level explanation on how you see those two kinds of student supports blending together. Um, this tech driven one, you know, is, is very techy, um, very right brain. And the other one is more creative and high touch, but I don't think they're exclusive of one another. So I, I'm hoping that in your answer, you can also talk about how the work product from this or the findings from this study or pilot programs will also help inform those organizations in achieving success on the other, at, at the other campuses, knowing that our Calbite Bright model is so different. Yeah, oh my God, there's so many layers to unpack in that question. So, so I'll attempt and, and other folks should jump in as they see fit. But the, the one thing I'll say, Hilde, that's interesting is um, in a lot of our intervention, early intervention work, especially on the DEI side, especially with early intervention programs like TRIO and some of these other things, there's always some sort of secret special sauce um, that's talked about in terms of why they drive, you know, outcomes. They build strong community. They 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 have an authentic relationship with the learners. There's there's uh, all these reasons why we love these programs. Um, but imagine if we actually could instrument these programs to understand what in the secret sauce actually gives it its flavor and efficacy. Right? What makes it um, impactful in the ways that we want to see to drive outcomes? And then how do we do all of that work? on even better, right, even, to, to even greater outcomes or to support more students. So I really don't actually view this as a tech intervention. I mean, we're a tech enabled college and so tech is available to us to be able to structure these interactions. And, and it's, it's, it's more important for us in some ways because of the way that our model is designed to be asynchronous and the engagements are um, done in a digital, you know, through a digital medium. And so we have to get much savvier at uh, the efficacy around the core interventions themselves to be able to deploy it in a technology-based setting with greater efficacy. But the instrumenting around that, how we determine and test out what's effective, we often assume that the things that we do in present state is the best that we can do, but for more resources or but for other things. And if we if we want to solve the problem on the scales that we need to solve it, then we need to be introducing greater efficiency and effectiveness in what we do. And we shouldn't be sad about that or scared about that or think that it's an infringement upon um, the good work that's already happening. But it's just the next evolution of what we need to do to really move the needle on equity for the outcomes for the communities of learners that we're talking about. We have to try new things and we have to make sure that what we're doing actually works. And that's very much what's at the heart of this. So I absolutely see, and having been a, a lifelong advocate and, and, and someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about, especially early intervention programs like Gear Up and Trio and some of these other ones, um, the, these are the, the sort of missing level of detail around what we're doing mm -hmm. that can actually make the difference on the side of the outcomes. And, um, you know, doc Dr. Rumor, Dr. Castleman, I would, I would love you to weigh in on, because I know you have actually at the ready plenty of examples of the way these kinds of things have been deployed and what the benefit might be. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, Hildy, is, um, Trustee Aguinaldo, is that um, 
we absolutely want this to be a shared and open process. So anything that we do here is fully for the benefit of everybody who is interested in, in solving this set of, of challenges facing these communities of learners. So um, that's that's just sort of regularly, we'll provide those updates to the board, but perhaps more importantly, we'll disseminate them through the networks available to us within the system, whether it's IEPI, whether it's the competency-based education pilot or other activities um, with groups of folks who are who are really interested in, in engaging on this. And we've done some Absolutely. of that on, so on me, like the enrollment management side and other thing, other places like that. But, but here is, here's the meat of what's most important right now. Let me jump in real quick. I, of course, I would love to hear um, from Dr. Kathleen and, Doc, and Dr. Room on the subject. But um, first, I love the analogy of secret sauce and, and giving it its flavor. I think that, that really resonated with me. Um, the second thing is that um, and another unfair comment hearkening back to our conversation yesterday, but if it's possible for us to hyper-focus on how this, this research is differentiated for communities of color, how are we going to um, you know, break out the research findings so that we could apply it specifically to students, student groups that we're looking at? So I hope that in the process of doing that hyper-focus that we could um, invite groups like Emoja. Um, to come and, and a two men to, to converse with Dr. Kathleen and Dr. Arun on what their experiences are um, and, you know, multiply that exponentially by all the other student groups. I'm um, still waiting for, uh, for an equivalent for the API community, but uh, TBD on that, uh, hopefully that, that comes eventually as a completely different subject, but um, I would just hope that we, we continue hyper-focusing on how we can benefit our students of color here. I am um, actually Ted. I think you should weigh in on that one, maybe before we turn things back over to um, Dr. Kasselman and Dr. Arum, um, because maybe you can talk a little bit about methodological approaches and practices around DEI internally with respect to the the Student Services Division. Absolutely. So um, obviously, we have a, a deep commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of the things that we've been working on, really, and and talking through is how we are able to view our students and be able to see patterns, but then understand that even when you see patterns, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily apply to every single individual. So what are the touch points to be able to individualize that attention? Uh, so although you might be able to create some generalities, you need to have multiple touch points throughout the process to, to really personalize, to individualize uh, the approach, whether it's from a, a, um, a counselor or instructor or from a tutor. Um, or perhaps a career services individual, like really trying to make sure that, that we meet the students where they are and then move them forward to what they feel is success for them. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of that. I think a lot of the work is TBD because uh, as we continue to look at data and understand behavioral science a little bit better, um, you know, our work will really deepen in terms of how we uh, collaborate with our own DEI team and then spread it out into our actions with students as, as well as each other in the institution. Dean Aram, is there anything you'd like to share in response before I, I offer a couple of thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I was going to say is uh, I think one of the sweet spots is um, the technology has advanced to the point where it en enables personalization of services. Uh, uh, everything from instruction to student support services, and that's that to me is the sweet spot. That you're just, you're not just deploying technology that uh, um, is unresponsive to uh, student behavior, but in fact is able to uh, shape and guide human responses to be, to uh, a variation in in um, uh, student needs and uh, uh, student patterns of success. Thank you, Dean Aram, and, and Member Aguinaldo, thank you so much for, for the, the great observations that you've made. Um, and I would offer a couple of remarks. One is to build on, on what Member Shabazian observed, which I think is a, an important insight that we really see uh, effective, and to Dean Aram's point, tech-enabled coaching and mentoring is core to the many, um, many of the strategies that we would apply. So, uh, I think it is right to say that that, that may be tech-enabled in many cases, but I think it's also important to observe that we see the most effective uh, evidence-based strategies as, as those that provide engagement, 
personalization, and often human connection and mentoring and support. And so I anticipate that that would be core to much of what we do. And I think that your, your latter point is equally important. And I one of the core tenets of applied uh, behavioral design work, certainly um, in our approach, is to actively engage um, students as co-designers um, and as sources of important feedback and guidance. And I, I, I think that a particular priority um, would be among the, the, the many groups represented in their affinity groups at Calbright College so that we're not um, being on students so much as co-designing with students and with Calbright faculty and staff strategies that create as much collective success for students as possible. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I just know that you'll get a lot of richer data sets if you involve the right groups. So thank you very much for your work on this. Thank you. We have a couple of more um, members. So board member Williams, and I think we had Vice President Costa, and I see um, our trustee member Karasova's hand up and uh, member Epstein. Y'all have to remember your places though. <laughs> uh, member, member Grandi, I, I appreciate you for you know raising or bringing bringing this issue up, and you know, and I'm I'm looking at the dollar amount, and I'm looking at the um, the language that's in the the actual item itself. I know we're calling it a partnership, but you know, to me, it seems like we're um, acquiring some services, and so I just wanted to um, know like ownership from an ownership standpoint who will own the products will UCI be able to share the in um, the the final products that are developed from this with other institutions or will this just be specifically unique to Calbright since you know we're, we're paying for it and you know one of the things that I saw that uh, Southern California Edison that they did a really good job at is benchmarking and so for me, what would have been really helpful in this is like a one page logic model that says, these are the specific deliverables. So like, are we getting an early alert system as a result of this? Like, what are we really getting? I understand the language and the, the general um, language that you're using, but what I'm not clear about is in six months, what do we get? In a year, what do we get? At the end of the term, what has Calbright specifically received as a result of spending the um, the four million dollars, and then um, you know what's UCI's uh, access point? Can they use it and sell it to other people later on, uh, um, or is this only going to be for Calbright once it's done? Um, I'll take a couple swings at that, uh, just but this is why it's not a contract uh, in the sense that it's a transaction where we are buying pens or a digital tool or any of those things. This is why it is actually sort of building in a collaborative manner, the functionality and capabilities across our institution within our technologies, within our staffing and professional development, within all of these layers in the organization that's required to actually perform this work. So the thing we get out of it is, is we have built out our organization to do this work in a particular way with our own staff over time. And at the end of the day, we have also um, proven the efficacy of all of the interventions and activities. And that's evidenced in actually our student outcomes that we're being held to account to, whether that's on the completion side or the labor market outcome side or those other things. So that's what we get out of that. And that's why it's not a transaction as you would find in a, in, in a, you know, if we were buying software seats or licenses. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I, and I might I tap like Cindy to Cindy on our, on our uh, legal yeah, team to it, talk a little bit about kind of why we ended up with this construction, for example. And I, I guess, so, so the main clear point then is I don't, I don't want to haggle about like the relationship, but the work that you guys are going to do are going to create some kind of tangible result. So yeah. is it going to be hard. a process yeah. that we get like, you know, so, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I've seen student engagement system, like I've demoed like tons of stuff for our colleges. Yeah. And so like when you talk about early alert and intrusive counseling, some of this language that you all are using when you talk about um, behavioral science, like, are we getting a process like that? Are we going to have an online portal? Are the counselors going to have a tool? Like, like, what are we going to get outside of just saying we're going to increase capacity? Like, is there going to be a tangible result 
that we can say that, you know, folks could log into and use and engage students with. Um, so, um, uh, I would explain it this way. So I would say like, yes, absolutely. The, the sort of process design, the, met, the methodological ability that we have to do this regular order kind of A-B testing on our intervention and communication works, our ability to measure efficacy. Those are all tangible things coming out of it. Um, we already have some of the underlying technologies that exist to be able to deliver these types of interventions, but they're not built out in the ways that make sense for that seamless delivery to occur, to occur from a student experience perspective end to end. And so, you know, we have a portal. Is that going to be the best tool for us going forward? It may or may not be. And, and how we're going to govern that decision and leverage this work to make that decision is going to be you know, what can we do in the interaction points through the, the technology um, meetings they have? So if, if folks are going through the portal, how, does the, how do we build these methodologies into making the portal most effective to, to achieve the outcome that we're trying to achieve? Um, so it, that, it's, um, it, it, it flows from how we are actually moving in terms of the, um, the, um, the actual pieces of the student experience that we're continuing to build out. And so it's the margin on efficacy on outcomes. And that is a combina gonna be a combination of, of process design, of training development, of um, lots of different proof points in terms of being able to share out what has been effective in terms of those intervention designs, including the technologies we've used to deliver it. Okay. Last thing. And, that, and I would say like, there's no proprietary interaction here, right? We're not, we're not going out and, and and contracting with a for-profit behavioral design for, firm, and, and then there's pride of ownership over these things. The, the virtue of doing this I think is you public. Should. public yeah, well, some no, of I mean, so uh, you know, <laughs> as a public institution, the public charge that we have is actually to create this for the purposes of driving outcomes for Californians. And these are two mission-aligned institutions that share that as the primary outcome of what we're doing. So the alignment with us and other entities on the organizational side. That's not to say it can't be accomplished through a for-profit public-private partnership, that we're not precluding that in the future, but the real value of this is that it is existing within our public education infrastructure. So I think one, one last thing, what would be helpful for me to move from abstract is like an opportunity to really experience Calbright. Like all the other colleges, I know what the student experience is like. I've never even seen Calbright, so I just, it's so abstract for me. I don't, it's hard to connect like how it would work when these kind of things come up because I just yeah. don't know what Calbright is. But you know, the other colleges is easy because I've seen online program. I've been in the classroom. I know what it's like. And so, you know, that's why I'm trying to make this more tangible because I, I just can't yeah. conceptualize what Calbright is. We can, um, no, it's a, it's a great point. And I think it's, um, you know, it's one we've been talking about internally. I was I was talking with the faculty on the on both the counseling and the instruction staff, and we were talking about um, like how do you give people a look or a feel? And primarily, we were talking about this from the perspective student perspective. How do we give them a sense of what the what the experience is, what the commitment is, what they would be getting in terms of the actual learning ex learning or uh, support experience? How do we give them a, a a trailer or a demo for what that would look like in a way that they could see themselves succeeding in the institution? They can feel the support from the folks on the front line that are providing the support. So we're, we're actually thinking about how to give people more of a, a tangible look and feel to what the Calbright experience is, is because it also is something that we need to orient our learners to. And we started doing these kinds of explainers around our programs. So for example, around our CRM program, mm -hmm. we uh, that the marketing communications and team has kind of worked with folks to build out um, a, a simplified explainer so that people could see themselves in these new kinds of careers. Um, but to get a sense of the of, of what the um, what the actual learning experience is, what the actual support experience is, um, that's a next stage of I think uh, what folks internally are are very eager to to share out publicly. Hey, thank you for that, um, Vice President Costa. You had a question. Yep. Thanks, President Haynes. Um, comment and question. I love this. I think this is amazing. And um, to go back to board members Perry's comments at the top, this is what differentiates Calbright. 
this is really cutting edge technology. And we all know that our students, um, similar to board member Aguinaldo, you know, in the broader community college um, environment, we're having some enrollment and persistence issues. It's even harder for Calbright students, candidly. They've had some interactions with higher ed. Many of them um, have left that experience, um, you know, not in a great place. Um, and so I think, you know, COVID has exacerbated what higher ed needs to do for digital natives. Um, and this is really cutting edge because, you know, we all grew up where there was on-site counseling. It was just a different college experience. And I think we need to be kind of evolving with, you know, what students need right now. So I'm very excited um, to President Menon's point. I love that we're partnering with the University of California. Um, I think it's really leveraging the best that California public uh, higher ed has to offer. Um, and so um, I wanna commend um, UC for partnering with us on this. Um, and to Mr. Uh, Board Member Williams' point, I mean, I think we have to have the data before we know what the it is. And so as I read the documents that were provided, you know, on page 10, where we're aligning to what kind of our key performance metrics are, we need to research what's happening with our students before we know what that is. And so I understand that, you know, there's a little bit of nuance in this <laughs> partnership um, because I don't think we know what we don't know quite yet. Um, my question uh, probably to Dr. Castleman though is because the velocity of change is so great right now with technology and COVID, um, at what point do the insights of our students' behavior become stale? how often do you have to go back to kind of figure out uh, which interventions or where the drop points are? Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Costa, both for your initial observations and I think for a very well taken question. And, you know, I would say um, I, our hope is that we can work closely with, with Calbright so that the, the process of inquiry um, is ongoing and continuous. That what I mean by that is that we wouldn't in this first six months or first year uh, do our behavioral diagnosis, data analysis, inclusive to member Aguinaldo's point of engagement with students and say, okay, we now know the Calbright student experience and therefore we can design several years of intervention based on that. I think to your point, um, especially uh, as, as the country, as the state, um, hopefully, uh, begins to emerge more steadily from COVID, I think we are entering and will continue to be in a period of fairly rapid change. Um, and so because of that, um, our, I, I, um, perhaps the, the useful analogy is one of a spiral where we do um, some initial diagnostic and analytic work to inform testing of strategies. We rigorously evaluate those strategies. We transparently and um, uh, identify those that work, work to scale evidence-based strategies, but as we look to scale those strategies, we do additional diagnostic and analytic work to inform what updates are necessary. And for the ones that don't work, we're transparent and honest about that and go back to the drawing board for additional analysis. And, and if I could just respond to one point you made, um, uh, which I think is so important, um, we've had the fortune of partnering with, with state agencies and colleges in numerous states. And the, the observation you made about the challenge working learners face coming back to school <laughs> and both getting um, back integrated academically, integrated with their peers and socially, doing so through technology that may be unfamiliar, as, as I imagine you know, is very common outside the Calbright context. What I think is unique here is how much Calbright as an institution is, first of all, designed around this population and um, the ways in which I, I hope, and I think we hope through this partnership that effect, effective mentoring and coaching and peer connection and tailored guidance and feedback to those adults can create as strong a set of supports and learning environments as possible. So thank you again very much for the question and observation. Thank you for that. Um, uh, board member Epstein, you're on mute. Yeah, I think that uh, that uh, member Tarasova was before me. Oh, okay. Well, we'll let... you, I'll go if you want me to. I don't know. Go Yulia, ahead. Yulia, what do you, you want to have the last word? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are a couple of things. Um, I thought this was a very interesting um, uh, agenda item, and 
one of the first things I discovered is that I didn't know what the word instantiate meant. So I, I've, you know, with, with Ajita, you're always kind of learning new words. So mine for this, this meeting was instantiate. Um, and, you know, if there's a show of hands, how many of you knew what nope. instantiate meant? No, I had to look it up too. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think this is a, a really exciting concept. I think it's exactly what we should be doing. Uh, I, I had a couple of observations. One is that um, I think we really need to try and integrate uh, the other community colleges into this work, um, you know, on the, maybe not at the very beginning, but but you know, not after five years either. Um, that we really need to be able to share this uh, this this wisdom we're we're acquiring. Um, the other thing is that I, I really feel that the five year time frame is too long. Um, the, you know, we we have a lot of urgency around what we're doing. Um, it, we're getting you know pressure from the outside. I, I I mean, I'd like to see this work done in three years rather than five. And um, I think it's really important that uh, that that we get results sooner. And, and, uh, and so I don't know if that's realistic, uh, but I, I do think it's, it would be very important to accelerate this quite a bit. Um, so, so I'll say one thing, because I, I actually think it's, it's something of a mindset shift. Um, and, and I heard it um, implicitly in some of the comments, which is, this is actually not a five-year longitudinal research study. This is literally year by year you build a foundation and you get better and better and the, and the margin on improvement gets shorter and shorter. It, it, so the, um, the, the reason I keep saying this thing is a capacity building thing is because we used to look at research that way. Yeah. We used to say, we're gonna study a group and we're gonna look at them over a couple of years. And, and we're gonna certainly do that on, on the longitudinal lens of things. But this is, this is the kind of work that actually gets you ready to make uh, improvements that you that are within your capacity and control as an organization at every stage of development you're in. So the reason to to do it over multiple years or five years is not because um, you know you're waiting till the fifth year to see results. It's actually because over five years you get to a level of excellence that is beyond um, what organizational entities in the public sector are capable of doing. And so there is like there is there is just honest hard work in the first couple of years of building that capacity and foundation because you're shifting the entire way the organization is engaging with things. And we're starting, we've already started that shift internally. People are, people really internally in the organization see this as a learning organization. And that's very different because higher education institutions are expert organizations. Um, and, and here the expertise is continuing to develop the, the, the process and the benefit. So you're constantly seeing the needle move on the outcomes. The, 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 Sorry, the, the child at home. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I, understand, I understand that. But, you know, the contract reads that it's a, there's a four-year, you know, kind of initial period. And then the fifth year is strategic planning and decision-making where they actually integrate it into the program. It, it just, that just seems too long. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I, I would hope that we'd be making kind of, uh, you know, fairly permanent decisions, you know, much sooner than in the fifth year. So I, you know, it says all the ones before that are pilots. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems, I understand what you're saying, but it, it, it's not how I read the contract, I guess. And I would just, you know, I, I, I trust you that you'll, that you'll do it right. But I, I really think we ought to accelerate this as much as possible. And, you know, shrink, I mean, I, I would prefer to shrink it to a, a shorter time period to put more urgency and, and resources sooner rather than spread it out over such a long period of time. Um, maybe just before we turn to Yulia, because we did have a, a lot of discussion um, around both the duration and, um, you know, sort of honesty about where we are developmentally as an organization and where we're trying to go. And I wonder if there's analogies to other, um, you know, public entities, especially who've kind of built out this capacity and sort of, is there a parallel construction and, and either Dr. Room or Dr. Castleman um, might be poised to answer this, um, that sort of speaks to that, right? Is there a there's implementation happens on an ongoing basis year by year as you're developing capacity. 
Um, but is it, you know, are we giving ourselves too little time, too much time, um, maybe through by way of benchmarking to other examples if you have them? Yeah, let, let me let me jump in here. So I, I think uh, one thing that's been missing from this conversation is that this kind of partnership can uh, uh, attract additional funding from outside agencies to accelerate the work that's being proposed here. So I uh, I, I agree with uh, Board Member Epstein. We need to be working quicker and and uh, more deeply in uh, accelerating this kind of work because of the needs we're facing um, uh, as a state, as a country. Uh, I think that's possible by, by thinking about this kind of work as a partnership. It's we're aligned, our institutions are aligned in terms of our goals. Um, we're uh, not seeing this as a fee for service contract. I would not be supporting this work if it was uh, framed and understood in that way. I think there's an opportunity here for Calbright to be a model for the country as a whole in how to do this kind of work. And part of that model means partnering with the top academic capacity in the country to do this work right and attract additional resources along the way. And so again, I, th I, I firmly believe that if we move forward with this sort of partnership, uh, the amount of resources that are gonna come into this effort from private foundations and federal sources will dwarf the amounts uh, that are, are gonna be invested internally in these partnerships. One thing that I would add, um, Member Epstein, thank you for uh, you know uh, providing the comments. Uh, it's to also amp kind of uh, support what uh, Dean Aram is saying and and um, President Menon. Uh, just the idea that we're going to be improving continuously. Um, the work with UCI with uh, Dr. Castleman and team uh, is going to be utilized to help us with continuous improvement. And at the end, I, I know that the contract may not can be read a certain way, but at the end, it's really the recommendations for how to develop um, and support that culture of continuous innovation so that our team can uh, carry it forward uh, in a way that is as intentional as possible. So thank you for those comments. Um, we're gonna go to um, member Teresova's question or comment. Thank you, President Haynes. I really want to reemphasize Tom's point about the timeline. That was my first question when I saw this wonderful <laughs> presentation. For me, it's about like how soon the students will see the improvement and changes. And I feel like something that uh, our board would appreciate is updates potentially on this partnership and any improvements that are happening like yearly so we can see where our students were at and where are they going to. Um, another point was raised by Trustee Williams that um, it would be really helpful for us definitely to see this, how the student life is happening and what our students experiencing Culbright and uh, for us to be better advocates for Culbright at first. But also I think another important point to that is maybe having a town hall with students. We as student, uh, I'm as a student trustee, I, ha I haven't had a conversation with the Culbright students and I'm not sure if any other trustees have ever met uh, Culbright students. And I think that can really help us in our advocacy um, further on. And last point, my last point and a question is that I know that Culbright is constantly engaging with the students and there are a lot of examples in this presentation about like what we're looking at from this partnership to gain. And I personally love the success coaching to identify the barriers that our students have. But my question is for you, I guess, President Menon, um, based on the current student feedback, is there any prioritization that we're going to have in this project to look at, like what students need first to be looked at and what needs to be changed as of today? Yes, and it's actually, um, and we'll talk about this a little when we get to the proactive outreach presentation, it's really driven by at what we're observing and what students are actually experiencing. So six months ago, we knew that the hardest part for students was 
the CCC application, and also the gap between when they completed the application and orientation starting in enrolling in uh, meaningfully and engaging in the academic content. And so um, for us, those were the those first uh, sets of engagement, kind of first that first four weeks, then that first eight weeks, um, that was what was uh, what was prioritized because having that upfront um, relationship and in, in, you know, putting that person on, on strong footing to, um, to carry out the rest of their career at the college um, was a critical condition of their, of their future success. So now if you think about that, the priorities around elongating that and to also understand what are the different patterns for different types of students um, that might require differential types of interventions, right? So one is just sort of like the stock set, what's the baseline? And then the other is, um, and, and how do we continue to improve that? And then the next part of that is, um, what are we learning about specific communities of learners that requires a differential approach, further inquiry, you know, deepening the type of intervention work we do um, and, and, and the assumptions that we make there. So uh, we are looking end to end student journey. We have to date kind of mm -hmm. focused on the front end of that experience at Calbright. And now we're looking at, uh, at it across the entire design journey. Um, so so uh, that is hopefully answers like part of the question, but the, the other points I just wanted to lift up that you uh, also made that I, um, that I take to heart and were uh, very aligned in terms of wanting to, to share and facilitate with the board is around being able to um, share out more of the real contextual experiences that um, our students are, are being able to face. And so we're absolutely looking to do that, not just on an annual basis, but in more of a real-time fashion, because the way that folks can benefit in institutions and other, you know, other folks can benefit from what we're learning um, is, is going to be a, a, a core part of the value that we bring to the table as an institution. Um, so I, I both appreciate your comments and know that we're, um, that we're eager to, to, to show and tell um, on, on that front. Um, and, and what's interesting about show and tell is we're not just gonna show you the good stuff. We're gonna show you the hard stuff and we're gonna show you what we're working through because uh, now I'll say something a little controversial. The great lie is that we have answers to how to do this work across the board in higher education. And the true fact is we don't for these communities of learners. The delta between what we know about how to effectively serve this community of learners across higher education and across the workforce system is very slim and limited. And so part of what we need to be able to be honest about is um, is the fact that you know we we are doing things we are no we are we are instrumenting ourselves to be able to get to efficacy to get to solutions, um, but nobody has cracked this nut. And if any higher education institution tells you they have, I would seriously question the data. And I, I just say that frankly. I mean, I've been looking at this work for decades now, and it is um, it is so important that the honest dialogue and the honest conversations and the honest sharing happen in this moment, because we're at a very pivotal point. So thank you so much for those comments. And before I close out this item and, and get and get public comment, um, I just want to add to this conversation. Um, I texted uh, uh, President Mignon that this is one of the most consequential um, conversations we've had, because it's on the, the nuts and bolts of why we are in existence. Um, and um, I want to, um, to stand behind the last comment of our president, which is if anyone tells you we have any idea of how to, how to engage this group of, of learners, they are lying. I'll just use the word, they are, they are lying. And we don't have to look at the data. We can see, um, well, we do. We have to look at who's on the bottom of that data in terms of our ability to engage, to reach, and to have persistence. And so um, this is, as I said yesterday at the Board of Governors um, meeting, and what I will repeat again, this is the work that we are intended to do for this population if we are to be a thriving economy, if we are to be a thri thriving state, and if those who are here in California and across the nation are to, in, are to be a part of that, we have to get some of these questions answered. So I want to thank our presenters for, for coming and for um, wanting and agreeing to partner 
with us in this work. Um, I am extremely excited and emotional, to be really honest, about the steps that we are about to take. So I'm now going to ask for public comment, if there's any. Yes, President Haynes. What is the plan for how UCI will collaborate with internal staff? Will a staff work group be formed in order to offer cross-functional feedback in order to inform and integrate UCI's plans and recommendations for interventions that will overlap with existing staff responsibilities? It's a great question. I know we don't normally respond to public comment, but I would love to take it this up is if, worth if that's responding. okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a great question because I think it can often be, um, you know, when you have an outside entity outside of the college coming in, there's always a question of how that interaction will happen. And the reality is that internally within the organization, there are teams, there are teams across learning and instruction, there are teams on enrollment services and welcome services, there are folks who are engaged on the marketing and communications team. And embedding problem solvers from the UCI team into the planning work that we do together, um, that ultimately is how this work has happened. It doesn't happen just in a committee somewhere. It doesn't happen in some isolated part of the organization, but it's really how we leverage internally within the organization, our ability um, to use uh, the resources that are available, available to us through UCI uh, and otherwise in order to avail ourselves of these things. And so, um, this is a this is this is why it is a, a, a joint and collaborative and embedded kind of uh, work that we'll do, and it's probably unlike the traditional ways that um, uh, things uh, things happen at, at other colleges. And, and Ben or Dr. Kesselman, if you have um, examples of like how you've worked with teams before, and you've worked in the public education setting and in public institutions for a number of years now. Um, you, you know that the, the nuances and the ins and outs of um, really being able to do this in respectful ways, engaging uh, the folks who are um, on the front lines of this work. Thank you, President Menon. And I, and I will use an op this opportunity briefly uh, to acknowledge something I've been remiss in saying, and that's the incredible contributions of my colleague, Alice Cho, who, who's on the presentation and has been a key architect um, in a lot of this work. And I, I, I mentioned, um, Alice, because I think as, as the Calbright team has come to know, Alice and, and our other staff and collaborators are, are um, great illustrators of, of what uh, Ajita described. I think for work to um, happen effectively, uh, to become embedded and sustained independent of external partnership, it has to be co-designed. It has to be done collaboratively, not you know something we build in a shop, so to speak, at UCI and, and kind of drive down to Calbright, but that from the first moment, we are co-designing and collaborating and understanding as deeply as we can um, the, the faculty and staff context and the student context. And the only way to do that is to immerse ourselves as much as we can. So I, I also very much appreciate the public comment and, and um, your remarks on that point as well, President Menon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other public comment? There is no other public comment, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, at this point, um, and, I, and again, I wanna thank the presenters um, for, for all of your SAGE um, information. Um, and again, um, let's all roll up our sleeves. This is where the work begins. Um, with that, I want to um, do two things. Uh, Mr. Um, Kajamaji also wanted to respond to item 3.3. .3, so we're gonna we're gonna go back and let him do that. And then um, we will um, uh, break for about five minutes for the board to look at item 3.1 in terms of the additional information that has been emailed to you. So um, Terry, is uh, Mr. Kajamaji available for his comment on 3.3? I am, if you can yes. hear me. Uh, yes, we can, thank you, go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, College President Menon, and members of the board. I am Eric Kaliumagi, the president of the Community College Association, which is the California Teachers Association affiliate for higher education. Last week, 
The Mount San Antonio College Board of Trustees, which is my home college, uh, held an in-person meeting, their fifth, as they actually returned to the in-person format in July. There are other districts opening up and still others, uh, San Diego comes to mind, have announced an intention to return to in-person in January. These boards are taking the lead from their students. Well over a million students in California are now meeting their peers and professors in in-person courses. Right now, I am sitting in a hotel preparing for a California Teachers Association board meeting, which will be held tomorrow in person in Burlingame. From there, I will travel to Sacramento to hold my own board's meeting, again, in person. The COVID-19 virus is scary and will likely be with us for many years, but it's not going away and California is reopening. I mention this because the current Zoom approach, although it has certain advantages, such as not having to travel to the meeting or to dress up or actually to dress at all, uh, has a number of serious disadvantages as well. It is difficult for the audience members to read the board members' body language, particularly with regards to those not on camera if they're not currently speaking. It's also difficult to communicate with other audience members. And you'd be surprised how often we do that because we often have overlapping interests. But more importantly, from the board's perspective, the board is unable to read the audience. You can hear the speakers, you can hear me, but the mood of the room, whether or not other people are nodding or rolling their eyes, the body language of the silent majority is a mystery to you. Our democratic processes are not always easy and the best ones are not always those of the lowest risk. I encourage this board to return to in-person meetings in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go um, on a break, I, I was remiss and we do need to get a motion and a second on um, item 3.4, which is the Calbright College um, University of California Irvine partnership proposal. So can I get a motion and a second to approve this item? So moved by Oh my God, we got, we have so many. I, That's because it's a good thing. I know, I know. Um, you got Andy had Yulia, it. you got I'm Yulia. Gonna get, uh, uh, yes, I'm gonna get uh, Ulia to, to move it. And who wants the second? Aguinaldo will second. Thank you, Agu Aguinaldo will second. Can we please um, call the roll? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Jolena Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. An enthusiastic aye. Kevin Hall. Aye. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Irma Ogwin. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye, in the manner of President Haynes. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Yes. Julia Tarasova. Aye. Los Villalobos. Aye. And Joseph Williams. Aye. Motion carries, President Haynes. Thank you, board members. Appreciate it. Um, 3.1, um, you should have received in your um, email box um, the information uh, requested relative to um, uh, resume. So. It is now three, uh, sorry, um, 1113. Um, for those of you who need to take a look at that, um, we, we're gonna come back after this break in about five minutes. Oh, well, exactly in five minutes. So go to it.
Oh. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. It's now um, 11.19, um, so I want to bring um, our uh, board members back um, for discussion on item 3.1. I'd like um, uh, our um, board liaison to um, just do a roll call vote to see who, who of our members is, uh, is in the room at this point. Okay. Yes. Do we have, we have a, whether we have a quorum. Hildegard Aguinaldo. Present. Amy Costa. Present. Tom Epstein. Here. Jolena Grande. Here. Kevin Hall. Here. Irma Oglin. Here. Jennifer Perry. Jennifer? Okay. Here, Bill, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Here, Bill I. <laughs> I'm present. Roy Shabazian? Here. Valerie Shaw? Here. Julia Tarasova? Los Villa Lobos? Here. And Joseph Williams? Here. The majority are here, President Haynes. Thank you. Uh, Board member Elizondo noted he's present as well. Oh, very good. I, I don't. Member uh, um, Elizondo, would you, uh, if you will respond to um, my voice and say that you're here, that would be great and we can note it. I don't hear him. 
Oh, there you are. He's okay. Here. All right. So I, I see his note to us. All right. So we are going um, back to um, um, item 3.1. I want us to be cognizant of the time. I had so hoped that we could get out on time, but that, and we're going to work toward that, but we do have two additional, at least no, three additional um, information items um, that we do have to get through as well as this one. So I just want us all to be cognizant of the time. Um, 3.1 is the VP of Workforce and Strategy, Workforce Strategy and Innovation. Um, we've had um, uh, uh, the presentation, but what we needed was some additional information on on um, the uh, on the individual who um, uh, we're voting on for that position. So um, we so can I get. Uh, um, our board members who have an interest in making a comment or have a question, um, let me know by a raise of hand and we can move forward there. It doesn't look, Tom, you uh, and Amy I've, um, had mentioned needing this information. So are you comfortable with the information that has been sent to you? Um, uh, so that we can um, get um, public comment on this one and then move forward. I am, seems like he has a great background. Okay, thank you. I am too, President Haynes. It was just a process thing for well, me. So, yeah. I, I, I get that, but I wanted to just bring that forward so that we are sort of all on the same page. I don't see any other hands raised relative to, to um, questions. So I'm gonna open this up for um, public comment on the item. There is no public comment, President Haynes. Um, given that there's no public comment, then um, can I get a motion to approve and a second? So moved. William second. moves and Epstein seconds. Um, can we get a, a roll call vote, please? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Jolena Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. Aye. Kevin Hull. Aye. Irma Olguin. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Yes. Yulia Tarasova. Aye. Los Villa Lobos. Aye. And Joseph Williams. Joseph? Aye. Motion carries, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, we are now going to go back to our information and reports. Um, item 4.2 is the audit response update. Hopefully, um, uh, the, uh, the, and the presenter of this is Brendan O'Callaghan, who is the Vice President of External Affairs and Marketing and Communications. Uh, thank you, President Haynes, uh, Vice President Costa, and members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Brendan O'Callaghan, the VP of Marketing, Communications, and External Affairs here at Calbright. Um, this is also my first time presenting to the board, uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as, as President Menon uh, shared in her remarks, uh, a critical part of Calbright's operations is a dedication to constant learning. Uh, iteration and improvement. Uh, as we move through our seven year startup period, uh, we continue to make substantial progress that reflects the hard work of teams across the college. Um, we're focused right now uh, on expanding our operations and capacity and building the foundation necessary for high quality growth for years to come. Um, and so I'm pleased to share to reiterate uh, what, what uh, President Menon shared in her remarks. Um, that as part of this progress, we were able to report to the California State Auditor this month that the college has now implemented six of the 10 consolidated remarks or consolidated recommendations uh, the auditor provided. And we remain on track for those that are not yet fully implemented. Uh, as you can see in this slide, we have developed policies, procedures, and measurement, measurement methods that range from procurement and hiring to student support, as well as marketing and outreach. Um, and again, just to reiterate, these advancements are a reflection of stellar work from every team at Calbright. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for their continued dedication uh, in implementing these important uh, endeavors. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the state auditor's report had 10 recommendations, uh, all of which Calbright agreed to and agreed with. Uh, and we've been, we've been working toward implementing as part of our strategic development. 
Uh, this past July, for example, we finalized a procurement handbook for the college that reflects best practices and state laws and regulations and held a college-wide training on the topic. Uh, and following approval by the board, uh, we were excited to welcome our new procurement coordinator to the team last week, in fact. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've implemented six of the 10 recommendations. Uh, and you can see on the slide that a couple of uh, numbers have an asterisk next to them. Uh, in some cases, uh, those recommend the recommendation language uh, said that we should develop a plan or method for measuring that plan by November of 2021, uh, and that we should show that the plan has been effective uh, come next, next summer, July 2022. Uh, for example, recommendation seven uh, says that we should develop an outreach plan and methods for measuring the effectiveness of the outreach plan uh, by this month. Um, but that in July, we'll need to show that the measurements and the methods for measurements and the plan itself um, have been effective. So we won't be able to fully uh, meet the criteria until uh, next summer. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, and so while we're pleased to make progress in fully implementing the majority of these recommendations and to be on track for, uh, for those that remain partially complete, many of these plans are dynamic and require regular attention and revision as we continue to learn and grow. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to all of these plans, or the majority of these plans in six month increments quarterly. I know on the marketing side of things, we're constantly learning and, and uh, iterating and becoming more efficient. Um, we'll be guided by our board approved strategic vision, as well as our implementation plan, which spans through the remaining years of our startup period. Uh, and we'll track our progress and make data informed adjustments. Um, and as an R&D laboratory, we'll share our learnings with our sister campuses as we collectively work to address shared challenges and strive to help more Californians succeed in higher education. Um, next slide. So thank you. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions from our colleagues, my colleagues on the board? I don't see any hands raised. Um, is there any public comment on, on oh, this President item? President Haney, Tom has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, please. I'm sorry, I was a little slow on the draw. Um, I'm just curious. So we've, we've written up a, a pretty detailed response to the audit. I, I just was curious, who, to whom was it submitted and have we gotten any reaction? Uh, yes, so it's, it's submitted to the state auditor. There's a, there's a portal that you up, upload um, responses to that provides updates as well as supporting documentation. Um, and so that, that was submitted uh, to the state auditor last week. Um, and I don't, I don't believe we've received any, uh, any word back from them. Uh, but last week was a, an odd week with uh, Veterans Day in the middle of it. Um, we've received confirmation of receipt, uh, which is important to us, and the auditor will undertake their process of reviewing the um, six-month response and will provide feedback and guidance to us, and they may have other areas of inquiry, in which case we'll respond to uh, whatever comes out of uh, any questions that they might have about the submission, um, and uh, we are waiting to hear back on them on the time frame for that. Other I don't see any other hands raised on, on that. Um, is there any public comment? There is no public comment, President Haynes. Thank you. This is an information item. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is to go back to the questions that were, that were raised um, in item 4.1. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Bell has, um, gone back and gotten some additional information for this body. And so I think it's important for us to hear hear that and, and be able to respond or comment on it. So if we, if you will, um, Jeff, yes, if you'll, um, thank you. Yes, Madam President, thank you. Uh, mem uh, Member Epstein, you had asked about the uh, academic and non-academic benefits, the uh, discrepancy that appeared to be between the ratios there and the dollar amounts. And we would, we did go back and take a look at that in the interim while we've been uh, uh, looking at other items here while the board's been looking at other items. And indeed, um, indeed it is true that the, uh, the slides were not updated uh, for, for that uh, disparity between the two. 
the uh, the total dollars don't change, but between uh, non-academic salaries uh, benefits and and academic salaries benefits, the numbers do change. And um, thank you for pointing it out to us. Uh, we had been looking at totals and had not and not updated that accordingly. And so in that middle column where you had seen that that figure, those figures look large. For example, the 840,000 that we were talking about, you, you follow, I'm, I'm, yeah, you're following. It should be 121. And that would correspond with the 37% on the 326 above, right? And that would be a 37%, basically a 37% benefits. Now, correspondingly, the number below that should be 2418 because that's that's going to be the number that corresponds with the 6556. So the numbers didn't when we when we did some adjustments between fund 11 and fund 12, we didn't adjust the display for you for the totals that shifted between fund 11 and fund 12 with the salaries and benefits between employees. We did not update this display for that accordingly. And that's our fault. And I apologize for that. So from a process standpoint, I think what we can do is make sure that we have the, the adjusted tables um, circulated and then also posted on the website. Uh, so we'll tend to that in the next, um, you know, by the end of the week before we break for the holidays. I appreciate that. And I think our board members will too. And if you'll make this, make sure that we get a, a, a revised copy of it, at least for our records so that we can review it. And if there's any subsequent questions, Thank um, you. we can put them out. Uh, Thank you. Trustee Thank Epstein, you. do you have any follow-up questions to that? You're on, okay. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's kind of what I wanted to know. All right, I appreciate that. Um, that eagle eye that you had, um, no, truly, I know you laugh because the way I say it, but I, I, we all do. We all help each other uh, understand what is in front of us. And sometimes we miss things and somebody, it's really helpful to have somebody else, um, you know, uh, bring it forward so that we can all be comfortable um, with what we're getting. Um, Vice President Costa. Just along those lines, you know, going forward on the budget, because uh, board member Epstein's question had me kind of wondering when we um, when we display benefits you know how we're accounting for pension because um, clearly you know the, the provision of pension benefits is not insignificant for our employees um, and so I just think that you know in other displays um, it's pretty clear between the benefits what are kind of more traditional health care benefits versus pension benefits and so I think going forward we should really have um, that clearly displayed when we look at it um, because it's a different calculation as far as our ongoing kind of obligation uh, and liability. Um, and I think it would be good to have that um, displayed going forward. Um, we, we can certainly generate that and, and, and the point is taken, I think, because it gives the board a perspective on the fiscal liability for the institution in addition yes. to what the actual costs might be relative to uh, the annual. So we can, we can definitely produce that. Thank you so much. Um, again, this is an information item. Um, so we're gonna move to uh, 4.3. Hey, thank you very much. I will be sharing my screen again. And this is an update on the proactive outreach through Welcome Services. And uh, this is always fun to provide some information on because to the point of several board members getting updates regularly on some of the progress we're making is always helpful. So um, I wanted to first start with the idea that this is based on human-centered design. Uh, and so what we do is we take time to understand the needs of our student population. We focus on a big question that we like to try to move towards. We gather some data and design the solutions, and then we iterate the approach. So this is a process that we uh, do within our student services and success team, and as well as uh, throughout the college in, in, um, in, in different groups. So the big question that we were looking at with our um, student population was, how might we provide consistent proactive outreach to students who have submitted their application or started their orientation, but have not made further progress? How might we do this while capturing the student voice? 
So it was a twofold issue. We wanted to make sure that students progress forward at the beginning of their journey, but we also needed to start to gather data on, you know, what, what is holding students back perhaps, or what is not helping them propel forward. So uh, we also created guiding questions to help us help guide us towards solutions. And uh, one of them is what is a cause for delay between application submission and orientation? And also how can we better support students through this process? And I wanted to emphasize that because it's about better supporting them. It's not that we were standing back, not supporting them whatsoever, but we want to be as intentional in our processes and we wanna make sure that they're as impactful as possible. We came up with a guiding activity from the questions, which is we were gonna go ahead and contact students in the application submitted and started orientation statuses, which are two different statuses that students go through uh, depending on what program they're in. And, and it's marked in Salesforce so that we can better track students. And, and so we wanted to look at those two statuses, contact the students, and then discover why they've paused. So we had an immediate plan and then we had a more long-term plan. The immediate plan was to really think through what's in our locus of control. What can we individually do as a team, as individuals and as a team, uh, without any real change to our services our, in, in terms of structure? So no new technology systems are built. What can we currently do? And so with that comes an immediate action plan where we're manually extracting contact information for students um, who've submitted applications and started orientation. Uh, and then what's that call to action? We wanted to get them to the scheduled CSEP. Uh, the results, uh, you can see, you know, we had 25 students who started program pathway as we began to focus on this more. And, and this is within about a month's time. Uh, enrolled in program pathway, provisionally enrolled. So that was five and then completed orientation. So went the furthest, we had seven. So we saw results um, with just our immediate plan. But we needed to think through a long-term plan of how do we systematize this and how do we make sure that we allow technology to help support us as well and amplify our work. So what we did was uh, we collaborated to create requirements for proactive outreach for students who have submitted an application or started orientation but taken no further action. So um, in teams, what we thought through was you know, who should we really focus on? When should we take the action? Uh, what should we be looking at? And, and how should we capture the student voice? So from there, we were able to use automation to help us. Now by automation, I don't want you to think that we allowed technology to reach out to the students. What we did instead was brainstorm how automation could be utilized to benefit our teams. So um, we brainstorm requirements for automated case creation. Again, that's something within Salesforce where a case is created and pings a team member for an action item. So we developed a time frame for those case creations. When, when should it happen? Uh, and then developed secondary case reasons as mini surveys so that we could track everything that uh, we were trying to figure out with our students on why they may not proceed. Uh, so in terms of the when, cases were created at 24 hours, 72 hours, seven days, two weeks, four weeks, and three months. And you know this is all something that, again, we were doing some of, but when you have so many students who are interested, uh, who maybe have some initial interest and fall off, we may reach out to them once or twice via email, text message, or a call. But then um, there were times that because there were more students coming in, you may not, maybe we didn't go back and ensure that, okay, did we follow up? with that first email or that first text message. So by creating additional cases, it's sort of like a reminder that pops up and then helps our team then reach out and do that warm touch uh, to, to make sure that students know we're there to help support them throughout the process. Among the secondary case reasons in the mini survey, what we found out was uh, in terms of why aren't students continuing, sometimes there were IT issues, like they had technology issues. Uh, sometimes they weren't clear on the next steps. Maybe they weren't interested anymore. Uh, maybe there were login issues. Maybe they were busy, but planned to continue or busy, but were hesitant to, con to continue, which is a little bit different. Uh, and then maybe they needed appointment help or perhaps there was no contact made whatsoever in the process. So these secondary reasons are things that we could then begin to look for patterns as well. So with that, we were able to also track things with 
the secondary case reasons. We were also able to track how long it takes us to close a case uh, by the hour and, and also by the owner. So whoever takes it within our welcome services team, uh, you know, the, the speed that they're able to, to close cases. And then also we were able to track the learner status following this. Because again, we were looking at app submitted and started orientation. So now we can see, okay, what is their learner status currently now? So we went live August 3rd, 2021. And this is just some data. So you can see um, these, again, within a time frame of about a month, um, unique students, how many unique students were contacted from application submitted and moving them to provisionally enrolled. Um, so we contacted 12 students 30 different times. So that's almost an average of three different contacts that were needed uh, as we reached out. Uh, and then also 17 students from application submitted to the started program pathway designation. So 17 unique students that were contacted 47 times. When you look at our other programs like CRM, um, you know, three unique students, four contacts made. Uh, with the started orientation to started program, you have 11 unique students with 17 contact ma contacts made. So really what we saw here is that we were contacting students quite a bit more and we were moving them forward. Uh, what's really interesting here is that when you look at the time, I mentioned that we can track time frame. 75% of all cases were closed within 24 hours. 23% of all cases were closed within one hour. So our team was able to reach out much more quickly. And, and now, you know, I'm not saying that all of these students would not have proceeded, but I believe that several of these students would not have proceeded without this kind of constant contact at the early stages, because if you wait too long, then it's a kind of uh, looking back at, okay, did I apply for this, you know, and not quite remembering. So it's so essential to do this uh, as quickly as possible in a, a fast time frame. When we look at a closer look, for the students whom we were able to reach, 11% were unclear of the next steps. 36% 36, 36 did not finish on their own because they were busy, or but they planned to continue. And then 38% were no longer interested in Calbright. So you can kind of see um, the statistics here. And what this allows us to do, though, is it helps us design more processes, more supports, and perhaps uh, more ways that we can help our students. So for instance, one of the immediate next steps that we took was, okay, well, uh, we saw that technology issues might be an, a problem. So uh, why don't we have someone who's on call at the beginning of, of orientations who can provide help with, with technology? So our student support specialists, they continue to expand in terms of the, um, the role that they have, the different duties. And so that's one of the areas that, that they added to them. So um, here's a different way to look at things. 57% of contacts were ready to continue. 38% of contacts were no longer interested. And then 5% of contacts were hesitant to continue with the enrollment process. So you know, this again gives us some more data to utilize of, okay, well with those 38%, how could we get them towards being interested or staying interested? And for the ones who are hesitant, how do we push them forward so that they join the 57% who are ready to continue? So what do we do with this? Well, we bring back the human-centered design approach and we begin to think through um, what are the needs of those students with those secondary uh, reasons of not proceeding or, or pausing. We need to gather more data, use the data that we have and design solutions and iterate the approach again. And so this is where partnerships with UCI are so essential because we can look at the data a certain way, but it helps when you have a partner alongside with you who is also able to look at things, uh, perhaps provide a more, you know, a, a different point of view or different ideas, uh, and then help us with not only what we're currently doing, but what we decide to design in the future as we improve it. So uh, among our next steps, we came up with two other questions that we're now exploring. How might we understand why students apply and become no longer interested? And then how might we further encourage and support students who are hesitant to continue? Because those might be similar things, but they might be very different. So as we now continue with the human-centered design approach, that learner-centered approach, uh, we're, we feel pretty confident that we can start to see patterns over time and then address them as needed. So uh, the end thing that I just wanted to mention is finding the why. Uh, you know, it, that's what it's all about as we empathize with our students, finding their why and then being able to move forward.
So with that, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to share an update and uh, open things up to any questions from the board. You're on mute, Pam. Thank you. Um, board member Grande. Thank you so much for this information. It is weedy, which is what I really like because it gives me the information that I'm constantly inquiring about. But more than anything, it gives us an opportunity to really take what's happening at Calbright and expand it out to the entire system to really answer the question, where did our students go and how do we bring them back? So thank you so much. And I look forward to the next iteration. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Board Member Epstein. Yeah, following up on Member Grande's comment, I, I also really appreciate this. I think it's very helpful. Um, and I was wondering, this may not be available, but you know, when you look at slide 17 and 18 on what the response was and how many stayed engaged, do we have any a way of knowing what your typical community college uh, student outreach result would be on something like this? Does anybody report that kind of information from any of the other colleges? That is a great question and I'm not sure of the answer. So if anyone else does have an answer on that, I'd, I'd be uh, happy to relinquish the mic. Um, I, I would say I haven't seen it tracked that way. Um, and part of the reason is because the way that the, um, uh, the way that the process is typically done at most institutions is, you know, enrollment things happen over here and um, then entry into programs happens a little bit over here. So we really look cross-sectionally at the data. Um, so we, we haven't seen a ton of things to benchmark to, but we are actually looking for those ways of really being able to differentiate how atypical or typical is this. Um, and so I, I think um, you know, we, would, we would invite opportunities to get access to data that would allow us to do some comparative benchmarking on that front, because um, often just students aren't tracked this way. Thanks. The final thing that I would add uh, is, you know, at the beginning, um, uh, President Menon had uh, mentioned that our numbers have, have been really accelerating. And I, I would say that there are a lot of factors. Uh, one of them is the proactive outreach. Uh, another one is our, um, our marketing campaigns. So, you know, as we continue to try to meet the needs of our students, you know, we, we want to continue to track this and make sure that our numbers continue to, to excel and, and improve uh, as we get students to continue uh, moving forward. So, um, yes, um, uh, a board member, um, Tara Silva. Thank you, President Haynes. I'm really excited about the outreach that's happening among the students and I'm really happy to see uh, about the number of contact and point of contacts that have been made to the students because oftentimes, yes, students are busy and like another, if they're confused about what next steps they have to take, obviously this is gonna be an important mm -hmm. part. Uh, my question is in regards to 38% that are no longer interested in Colbride. Is there any way that we can talk with those students to ask them whether they chose another institution? Or are they not interested in pursuing uh, a class whatsoever, uh, what are their reasoning? Because I feel like that's important for us as we move forward to understand those issues. Yeah, absolutely. And we're already making plans for how we can, um, we can do mini surveys for when we do make contact. Now, some of the time, of course, um, you know, they, they may not give much of a reason, but we wanna get as much information as possible so that we can design information to help them understand how we could be part of the solution for them to leading to success. Um, yes, we've, we've also, I think we're developing hypotheses around some of those reasons as well for us to be able to, to test out. Um, and the other thing I'll say is it's our, one of the hypotheses is also, we wanna be able to convey an expectation of what's involved in the, um, in the actual uh, journey and experience. So, um, what does it mean? What is the sort of responsibility in taking on this? What do you have to be sort of prepared um, to, uh, to commit yourself to? And so 
the extent that some of the stuff that we can do on the explainer side at the beginning of the process so that people have an understanding of what they're signing up for, um, we think is gonna take us a step closer to bridging the gap, um, but we're gonna see. And if that's not the thing, then um, it might be others. So one is just getting granular and, and digging into inquiry on that 38%. And then the other part of it is we have, um, you know, we know that there's gaps in understanding between some of the programs that we offer and what um, awareness folks have about what opportunities um, exist for them in terms of programs that they should pursue or what the labor market is saying is needed and, and all of those other things. So those are two areas that I think we're going to be um, both digging into further in terms of understanding what aspects of improvement are needed to, to capture more of that 38%. And then the other thing is, what more could we be doing upfront to give folks a sense of expectation about what's involved? Yeah, thank you for that response, President Minon. And as you're talking about providing the expectations to the students, I think an important part uh, to add to that is also what resources are available to yes. the students. Um, so upfront they know what they can get access to I think that would be helpful for them to know in order to stay enrolled and continue pursuing their education in Calbright. That's a great point yes. So I do um, and so I do want to um, add to this conversation just a wee bit so uh, Trustee Tarasova um, asked one of the questions which is that group of uh, no longer interested. I am very interested in, in us really de delving deep into the no longer interested piece of that, um, because I think it will inform us in, in ways that we maybe don't even understand now. The other, the other response was the, um, the hesitancy. And I, I'm hoping that um, you will keep that on the agenda as well. It appears that some of it, of it was, it may well be the technology, it may be any number of things, but I think mixed up into that is whether or not I can do it or not, um, uh, whether I have, you know, whether I have the time. So I, I wanna keep that question out on the table as well um, to figure out what those different, what, what those hesitancies are and how do they differ from those who are no longer interested. Um, I will say, Pam, um, you know, we don't have trend data on that, but we do have a lot of anecdotal data on that from students, um, what some of the anxieties are about feeling um, well enough or good enough or yeah. uh, thinking that it's possible. And, and so it is definitely, um, is definitely a real thing. We're not, we're not seeing numbers around that right. exactly, but, um, but qualitatively for sure. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any of our, our, of our trustees um, with hands up, so I want to go to public comment. There is no public comment, President Haynes, and to do a time check, it's 1154. Thank you. Um, then we're going to um, move forward on 4.4, which is reports on contracts. I don't think that'll take very long. Jeff? Yes, Madam President, there's uh, nine additional contracts that were executed in October, a professional service agreement, a second extension, four new professional service agreements, and three of the cadence contracts. Total for the uh, October was $586,125. In addition to that, there was the um, uh, summary of purchases in October totaling $215,000. Thank you. Yes, um, any public comment? I'm sorry, any comment from our board members? Yes, Tom. Determined to speak on every item today. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I just wanna know what these cadence contracts yeah. are and, and how, why these three colleges are, you know, are picked and what are we um, doing? Yes, uh, you, you may remember um, many months ago, um, we received a uh, grant from the Federal Defense Department vis-a-vis -vis the Office of Planning and Research in the governor's office to look into defense advanced manufacturing and specifically around the convening of um, uh, up to 10 institutions who were interested in providing work-based learning opportunities within um, the advanced uh, defense manufacturing space. And so um, these are some of the participating institutions in that cadence project. Um, and um, it's, it's against that grant that's being managed by the FCCCC. 
Thank you. Other questions from our board? Well, I don't. What is, what is CalBright's role? Uh, mm -hmm. So we're actually um, going to be pursuing uh, the, um, so we're, we're facilitating the, um, the access for these institutions into the grant for um, the work-based learning student internships. And we are also uh, going to be engaging in convening this body of employers uh, around uh, research associated with the skills requirements and potential opportunities for future training within this field. So it's, a, it's an important potential entry point for us in terms of the advanced manufacturing uh, sets of technologies that are required, not just in defense manufacturing, but advanced manufacturing more broadly. If you remember when the board approved a series of programs in the um, spring, one of the areas that we were looking at that was on the horizon that this is kind of the early planning and research for was that intersection of potential technologies in the advanced manufacturing space. Any other follow-up questions? <clears throat> okay, then I'm going to ask for public comment. There is no public comment, President Haynes. Thank you. Um, we have a few more items and then I can, um, we can adjourn. Um, so the, we now have our constituency group reports, um, the Calbright um, Academic Senate report from Michael Stewart. With two minutes to spare, I still get to say good morning, President Haynes, good Vice morning. President Costa and uh, members of the board. My name is Michael Stewart. I'm the Academic Senate President here at Calbright. I just wanted to give you a quick report on what we've been doing. Calbright's Academic Senate had just went to the fall plenary um, board meeting, which we were well received. Uh, times have changed now that we have an Academic Senate. We casted our first vote as a Academic Senate on November 4th at 9.44 a.m. That was our first delegate vote. And I had to mark that because that was huge for our college. So we showed up, met with the other presidents, the other delegates, and by the end of the meeting, we had a bunch of contact information and some new friends that we met. I also had the pleasure of sitting next to board member Grande at the, uh, at the meeting. Kind of walked up on her, didn't even know she was there. I came in my typical shorts and uh, it's very top sider fashions. And <laughs> she's like, okay, I guess you are Michael Stewart. So it was a great event. It was good to see that Calbright was received in a different fashion now. And they were actually inquiring if we could come back and present probably at the next one on online learning. I looked at some of their stuff. And even though Calbright is stumbling and making changes and pivoting, I think we're leaps and bounds beyond some of the other colleges that are trying to play catch up with COVID. So that's a good testament to our, our faculty and, and our staff that are hanging in there with this. Um, on another note, we are looking as Academic Senate to uh, research and think about different LMS selections. So the Senate has met and voted on looking at Canvas as our primary LMS. Um, and with the transition of our IT department, we have not been able to bring in a group and have official meetings about what that would take and what it would entail throughout the campus. So right now we're in the preliminary stages of just looking at it, see what's going on. But once we get further into it, we'd like to include our CTO when they're hired, our chief of operations, and our VP of learning and instruction so that we can all sit and have open collaboration about what academic Senate would like to do and what the college sees uh, the vision of the LMS and the student learning and implementation. So pretty much that's all that we had, just those two things I wanted to talk about, just you know, us going down to Long Beach and making a physical presence. And that was probably the biggest thing that we've done in a while at Calbright as Academic Senate. So I will open the floor up for any questions. Mr. Sh uh, Shabazian. Uh, President Stewart, I just wanted to thank you for your report. Uh, great to hear about uh, your participation in the plenary. 
And, uh, and thank you specifically for mentioning uh, this issue with the LMS. And, uh, and I encourage and welcome your further uh, reporting on how things are going in terms of uh, the faculty perspective on getting an LMS that is going to serve the academic needs of the college well. Thank you. As you know, our, our main focus uh, with everybody at Calvite, staff, faculty included, is what's best for the student and what's best for their interaction with us, their learning process, and just engagement. So thank you for noting that. And thank you. Um, our next item is the Calbright Faculty Association Report, and we have Ashley o uh, Odell. Hello, uh, President Haynes, Vice President Costa, and esteemed members of the board. I'm happy to provide a report today on the activities of the Calbright Faculty Association. My report today is focused on an update on progress uh, in the bargaining of our inaugural faculty contract. Uh, meeting cadence has been established to maintain momentum, and the team met on November 1st, 5th, 10th, today on the 16th, and again on the 22nd. Um, we're updating templates for faculty evaluation with strategic and inclusive language for assessment of fac faculty contributions to the college and student success. Our hardworking team has been applying the interest-based bargaining approach to make these adjustments and also to develop and present three salary schedule proposals based on extensive research, which will lay the foundation for discussions regarding equitable pay for our faculty. We plan to move then into a prioritization process of the many articles that are part of a faculty contract. As you know, all of these things take time. It was really easy for me to summarize it, <laughs> but I, this is a lot of back and forth with these things, but I'll continue to update you on this, this process, which is an important part of establishing our faculty um, situation at Calbright. Um, I want to quickly thank President Haynes for her comments regarding the importance of Calbright to addressing changes in the labor market and several board members' interest in further advocacy. Uh, we as a faculty are working diligently to support the services, content, and learning that will allow for us to address these needs. And I think I can speak for the faculty when I say that we look forward to discussions around how we can tell our story and invest in supporting the special populations that we serve. And that's it for me. Um, I you know, put us only four minutes over time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we're going to go to public forum at this point. Is there any public um, comment? There is no public comment, President Haynes. Then be before then. Thank you. And before we before we adjourn, I just have one more um, one more thank you, and that is to um, to the staff of Calbright. It has not gone unnoticed. Um, by any stretch of the imagination, the Herculean work that you have been doing over the, this last several months, uh, since the inception of Calbright, um, you are to be commended um, for your, your steadfast commitment, for your commitment to the values and to the work that, that um, um, you've been asked to do. Um, and I just know um, just how important that work is. And I think by your commitment, you know how important this work is. And I didn't want to go um, into, um, by ending this this year, this is our last full board meeting of the Board of Trustees for Calbright. And I know that my colleagues share this, um, this sentiment. Thank you so much for, for working on behalf of, um, of the students who are being served and the students who are about to be served. Um, it is work, that is absolutely well worth doing. And, um, and we are glad as a board that we have partnered with you to do the work. So with that, um, I'd like to adjourn our meeting and thank my colleagues for hanging in there. We're only four minutes after 12, um, better than yesterday. <laughs> and um, look forward to, to seeing you soon. Thank you, bye. <laughs>